Good evening, and welcome to the City of Dublin Planning and Zoning Commission. You can join the meeting in person at 5555 Perimeter Drive, and also access the meeting via the live stream on the city's website. We welcome public participation, including public comments on cases, and are pleased to see the public out tonight. This time, if you will stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Bia, I'll turn time over to you for our roll call. Ms. Harder. Here. Mr. Shanak? Here. Ms. Call? Here. Mr. Suplak? Here. Mr. Way? Here. Mr. Snare? Here. Mr. Fishman? Here. Here. Thank you. Um, tonight we have uh, not just the documents, but also a set of meeting minutes. There is one correction that has been added to the meeting minutes uh, in the last section prior to adjournment. The dates corrected uh, were corrected from stating March 20th, excuse me, 28th through 20th to the appropriate March 28th through 30th. I will entertain a motion to accept the documents into the record and approve the meeting minutes from the January 19th, 2023 meeting. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Suplak. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Ms. Beal. Mr. Shanak. Approved. Mr. Fishman. Yes. Mr. Snare. Yes. Ms. Paul. Yes. Mr. Suplak. Yes. Ms. Harder? Yes. Mr. Way? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Beal. The Planning and Zoning Commission is an advisory board to City Council when making recommendations on matters of rezoning and plotting of property. In other cases, the Commission has the final decision making responsibility. Uh, anyone who intends to address the Commission on any of these administ administrative cases must be sworn in. There are no cases eligible for the consent agenda this evening. The agenda order is typically determined at the beginning of the meeting by the chair. The rules and regulations of the Planning and Zoning Commission state that no new agenda items are to be introduced after 10.30 p.m. The meeting procedure for reviewing cases this evening will begin with a staff presentation, followed by an opportunity for the applicant to make a presentation. The commission will then have the opportunity to ask questions of both staff and the applicant. The commission will then hear any public comment. We ask that all public comment be provided at the podium that you see there, and each speaker provide their name and address for the record. Prior to speaking, please press, press the green light and watch for the green light on the microphone prior to speaking. Following the public comment on each case, the commission will enter into a deliberation period prior to rending, rendering our decision. So the agenda order this evening, we do have one postponed case, and we will then proceed with the Dublin Scioto High School Athletic Outbuildings at 4000 Hard Road, followed by the Indus Bridge Street concept plan. Uh, so anyone intending to address the commission on any of these cases this evening, will you please stand, raise your right hand, and answer in the affirmative. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony to this commission. Thank you. All right, with that, we will start with our first case, Dublin Scioto High School Athletic Outbuildings at 4000 Hard Road, 22-164 AFDP. This is an amended final development plan. This application is a request for a review and approval of the AFDP to construct three athletic outbuildings behind the existing school that include a batting facility, a concession stand for softball and baseball. The 54.3 acre site is zoned planned unit development northeast quad and located approximately 520 feet northwest of the intersection of Hard Road and Emerald Parkway. Ms. Mullinax, welcome, and I'll turn the time over to you for our presentation. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, this case is for review and approval of an amended final development plan located at 4000 Hard Road for the Dublin Scioto High School. Approval for a planned unit development is a three-step process with an additional fourth step if amendments to an approved final development plan are required. This evening, the applicant is requesting the commission's review and approval of an amended final development plan and PZC is the final reviewing body for that determination. 
The 65.25 acre site is highlighted here in yellow and located northwest of the intersection of Hard Road and Emerald Parkway. The site is zoned PUD Northeast Quad and is within sub area 10. The existing high school building is indicated by the yellow star, and then the proposed three athletic outbuildings are indicated by the blue stars. These are the existing conditions at the athletic field, looking northwest as well as southwest, where the proposed multi-use batting facility is going to be located. The existing conditions at the baseball field show a baseball concession and score building and a new baseball concession and score building will take its place. Here at the softball, peel, softball field, excuse me, uh, bleachers are located behind the home plate and a new softball concession and score building will take its place. The site has developed through the PUD development process and since PZC approved the final development plan in 1993, subsequent revisions uh, have been made to the approved FDP to permit various outbuilding additions as well as site improvements. And so tonight, again, the commission will be reviewing an amended final development plan to permit the addition of three athletic outbuildings. So the proposed site plan depicts the athletic buildings and their locations, which are oriented around the football stadium. An 8,652 square foot multi-use batting facility will be constructed within the existing athletic field. And the existing baseball concession and score building will be demolished and replaced with an 843 square foot building for the same use. And the existing bleachers at the softball field will be replaced with the 538 square foot softball concession and score building. Additionally, minor site improvements, including new or replaced pavement areas, landscaping and bleacher location are proposed immediately around these buildings. The applicant is meeting all setbacks and lot coverage requirements for the proposed improvements. So the proposed batting facility will be used for indoor hitting practice as well as storage for baseball and softball equipment and also provide new restroom facilities. The building's height and proposed materials meet the development text requirements, which are required to coordinate with the existing school and the surrounding structures as well. The building uses a combination of brick, metal wall panels, and stone with a standing seam metal roof. And the east and west elevations incorporate garage doors to allow for ventilation during practice in the warmer months. The proposed two-story baseball building shown meets the development text requirements for building height as well as materials. Like the batting facility, this building uses the same materials and incorporates a rolling counter door and cantilevered metal canopy over the concession area. Clear glazing is proposed on the first and second levels facing the uh, athletic field. And the proposed softball building also meets development text requirements for building height and materials. The same materials are continuing to be used throughout these buildings and a similar concession um, stand design is also shown. Spandrel glass uh, is proposed to conceal visible utilities within the building in addition to the clear glazing facing the field. All athletic um, outbuildings will use the materials that are shown. The applicant has experienced some maintenance, maintenance issues with existing split face CMU stone on existing outbuildings and is proposing to switch to a custom cast stone, which will aid with um, various maintenance that they um, have been experiencing issues with. Um, and staff is supportive of the material change. Staff is also recommending a condition of approval to allow administrative approval material changes to incorporate substantially similar uh, replacements if it's necessary uh, based on bidding, pricing, and availability during the contract process. These are the proposed doors and windows which staff is supportive of. 
And the applicant meets landscaping requirements outlined both in the development text as well as the double landscape code. For the batting facility, the applicant is removing uh, two existing trees within the construction limits and replacing with six new trees. Three additional trees will be planted to meet ground coverage requirements and building foundation plantings will be added for visual interest along the brick walls. The batting facility will drain into a proposed underground storage system located just south of the new facility shown here on the landscape plan. And staff is recommending two conditions for approval. The first being that the landscape plan is revised to show the existing trees to be removed on this plan prior to building permitting, as well as the, that the applicant continue to work with engineering to demonstrate stormwater management compliance. And finally, here we have the renderings for the batting facility looking north and southwest and the renderings for the softball and baseball buildings. All AFDP criteria is either met, met with conditions or not applicable. And planning recommends approval of the amended final development plan with three conditions. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and the applicant team is in attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mullinax. And we will do questions together on this one. So we'd like to turn some time over to the applicant if you have a presentation this evening. It's green. Uh, you need a name and address. Do I remember that right? Yes, please. Name and address for the record. My name is uh, Stephen Turks. Uh, Turks is spelled T-U-R-C-K-E-S with Perkins and Will Architects located in Chicago. That address is 410 North Michigan Avenue, um, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. Thank you. Um, I think Ms. Mullinex did a, a, a dandy job this evening presenting the, uh, the, the submittal. And I would add that, um, one, one thing I would add would be that we went to great care to really look at the existing outbuildings, particularly the, particularly the two buildings that set to the south of the stadium. Those are concessions and uh, toilet facilities. Those are the buildings that have uh, the, the uh, split-faced uh, concrete block base, brick, and then uh, standing seam metal roof, as opposed to some of the other outbuildings like the existing uh, concessions behind baseball, for instance, the one that's coming down, as the precedent for the new buildings. So new buildings, as, as was described, uh, have now a cast stone base uh, with brick that matches the existing uh, metal, metal trim for the roof uh, soffits, fascias, again, matching the color of the existing and the standing seam metal roof. So very much in keeping with uh, the, the, the two outbuildings that set to the south, the more significant, really, outbuildings that set to the south, the south side of the stadium. Um, with that, I would entertain any questions you might have. And do you have material samples? Are those your materials? You do, samples? yeah. If yeah. you wouldn't mind, if we could, um, Ms. Mullinax, could you facilitate in getting that to the commission in case they have questions, especially with the, the cement replacement, the cement block? So if I walk away from this? Yes. Problem? Yes, thank you. So if I can yes, thank you. So, so we've got the blended development for the base of the sign, the uh, cast stone, and the second natural stone starter. So the natural stone is there just to prove it. Uh, no. Oh, man. Uh, the class, which is based on the class, and then the scandal. It actually is concealing the scorer's table that sits behind it. So it's kind of a, you know, keeping the glass, but also providing some privacy for the folks sitting behind the scorer's, scorer's table. Then it's vision glass above that, obviously, for, for, uh, for, for you know, sight lines. So those are the principal materials that are on all the buildings. 
Thank you. And for Ms. Beal and team um, facilitating, I do want to say that while the applicant stepped away from the microphone, he described each of the primary materials and including the glass windows for the commission and for the audience here this evening. Does anyone in the commission wish to see the materials up close? Or have, did you have the opportunity before the meeting if you wanted to see the materials? I would I would add that on the on the screen for you now are is that actual sample panel held up against the, the brick that's out there to give you a, a good sense of the match of the, of the two. Right. Anyone? Am I looking at, the, is it glass with the green or is that, it, it, the color behind it, is that what they would see on top next, yeah. So that's pretty much what you would see. Uh, is that it, it is the, it's the back surface of the engine. But the color behind it is that the not and Ms. Mullinax, could you speak to the placement? Yeah, so the glass that's being referred to is a spandrel glass, which will only be utilized in two window panel areas. Um, like the applicant mentioned, it's the softball field, and it's to screen a uh, utility area underneath the scorer. So there really will be very limited um, application of the spandrel glass, whereas the rest of the glazing is all clear. Okay, so if there's no desire from the commission to look closer at the materials, we will proceed to the questions. Okay. So if I could have you remain, and then we will handle questions for both the applicant and for staff together. Mr. Chinock, do you wanna start us off? Sure, uh, since we're on the subject of spandrel, is the spandrel glass absolutely necessary, or would it, if we, were to say we prefer not to have spandrel with that how's that affect the facility use we could probably do some kind of shadow box behind it uh i do think providing some privacy for you know because folks will be sitting at the scorers table um you know uh and to, you know for folks that are on the field looking back through those windows just to have some privacy underneath the table seems like an appropriate response to us okay thank you but if you prefer pure vision glass we could probably detail it with as I said, if you know what a shadow box is behind it, so it's, you get the pure vision glass and basically build a gyp wall behind it, and you know we could do that if if that was sure. The I just the, of the sorry, the, the just the question is more about when the use changes or if the scorers table might move to another side. Just having that be more flexible, not doing spandrel in that area. We prefer to have glass vision glass there. Yeah, the planning the planning is such that on one side of the scorers area at softball is concessions. On the other side is a small um, uh, locker room. Based on what uh, is at Jerome right now, the Jerome baseball has got those components. And so that's, sure. you know, we were asked to, to do that. Yeah. Thank you. I have a few, I have a few more. Uh, Ms. Mullinex, did you want to provide any clarity there? I just wanted to mention on the record that spandrel glass is permitted, um, so there's no concerns um, with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mullinax. Yes, Mr. Chinock, continue. Um, I assume that the um, parking requirements won't won't change with these facilities. The parking, parking, no, no. That what's I mean, we're, we're not really the, the applicant, the school districts. It's, there's no real change in use. Yeah. Um, baseball will continue to be baseball and softball, softball. They do have batting cages open air to open to the air uh, that's set adjacent to the the existing baseball field. This brings those inside. So the use on site, um, the intensity of use will remain the same. And then I assume the uh, this might be more of a uh, question for the uh, operator, but the uh, the building's going to be open. I assume the concessions are going to be limited when they're open. But is the batting cage going to be open gently? Like, or is there going to be a certain times it'll operate? And then same with the restrooms there? I think that would be up to the coaches. If you if you could step forward and state your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Jeff Stark. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Dublin City Schools, 6371A Shire Rings Road, Dublin. Um, the, the, the will be open during school hours or for school activity. It is not currently on our rental sheet to be rented out. Okay, thank you. And one final question, I'll be done. <laughs> the uh, the S that the large S logo is that sign is that considered signage or is that? Um, it is not. Um, it is internal to the site and not 
um, directly visible from the right of way and you know providing um, directions or wayfinding. It's more of an aesthetic um, that's utilizing the dark brick from the brick sample that's shown on the chair over there um, to incorporate and provide the, the S design in the um, side of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chinock. Thank you, Ms. Mullinex. Ms. Harder. Uh, yes, I just had a couple of questions um, with the color used in, uh, around is that each school has a different color and maybe with that S and so forth, uh, thinking about the Scioto colors, have you thought about that with that con incorporating the two? That's why the green was sticking out at me. I was just wondering if that was a green you were using. That's not, I understand, but um, each school has a different color. So I'm not quite sure what your question is. Sorry, when I when you look at the S, the S can okay. you recall? Uh, tell me again what color that is. That so the the S is so the the brick on the on the uh, the hitting facility is what we would call a blended brick. It's not all the same color. So what we're doing is taking the darkest brick in that blend okay. and using it uh, in the S. So if you look at that, um, it's basically turning the brick on end. So you're seeing sort of the short. You know, it's basically if I can go back over here. The short side of the brick, but also project it out. Okay. So it's staggered, so it's out in and out. So it forms that block. That's, we feel like it is a, uh, uh, you know, some more, more of a subtle uh, approach to getting something that has, has to do with school spirit. Um, I personally feel like if that was painted green, it would, it would be a little jarring. I agree. I'm glad that you. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, what the colors are. I appreciate that. I just have a couple other uh, safety measures and so sure. forth about um, doors uh, and the windows. To me, are windows that um, are over probably what the high school is using, where they're kind of shatter proof and so forth. What about the doors? Are those um, safety measures? Each school is kind of looking into safety measures. Sure, the doors are uh, steel hollow metal doors, insulate, the exterior doors, insulated doors. They would have the, 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 the type of hardware that the district is, typically uses on its exterior doors. And then um, parking in that area, is it being eliminated, maybe just those small little areas where maybe four cars could park? During the high school games, um, they have EMS up there. The, uh, and so I wanted to make sure that uh, they still had a place to park up close. We've had no conversations about eliminating uh, parking. And so I, I mean, I, I could uh, turn to Mr. I just Stark. wasn't sure if, if the area still permitted. It does. It does. It does. Okay. Yeah. We've not, we've not reduced any parking uh, through doing any of this. We have, we have a little bit of an additional paving where the building needs to, you know, sort of transition back to the existing, uh, existing paving. So we're adding a little bit to connect the building to those existing uh, paving areas. Okay. Um, and then um, over at Kaufman, they have um, a screening with their softball, uh, just with some trees, landscaping, and so forth. That is that anything that you think would be necessary or uh, helpful in screening? There's uh, homes that are on the other side. It'd be where the um, where the ballpark ends. And while you're out there, I was just thinking if that was something you would. Maybe we could go to the site plan. And I, maybe you could help me understand screening from. Uh, I was thinking at the when um, you're working at the front and you're putting around trees. That's I see that. But then you also have um, there's the softball field itself, and at the edge, I didn't know if that needed some screening around that area. There is a walkway there, a pedestrian, and then there are some homes there. If this is an opportunity to look at that. Are you talking about homes that are, uh, if we just walked it, from home plate to center field and kept going, there's the homes that are yes, back yes. there? Yes, uh, To be candid, we've not had any conversation about any, any screening from those homes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harder. Mr. Way, do you have any questions for the applicant or for staff? I have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Way. Mr. Suplak. Um, forgive me, Steve. I, I, walk me through your... I guess I'm going to the foundation plant, the foundation uh, landscape around the building. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's in large part very full, right, on the plan. 
and I know the renderings never do it justice, but uh, I'm also staring at, there is a rendering of, I think the south elevation in particular, which is a large mass of singular plate of brick, low plantings, right? The, the plantings there yeah. do not look mature. I guess I'm concerned, is it too big of a space? Does it need more verticality in it? Are we gonna get be, that verticality yeah, be, in it? To be candid, the plantings changed post rendering. Uh, we did get uh, staff com comments back that asked us to provide more variation, which the current landscape plan, in both in sort of depth and height I, and plant material, okay. which the current landscape plan does address. Got it. And, and I did see that you got, you got the junipers, you got yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suplak. Mr. Fishman, do you have any questions for applicant or for the staff? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Schneer. I had one question about the, uh, about the split face mm -hmm. base and it's, it's utilized elsewhere. It is. The, the narrative indicates that it didn't weather well. Um, to me, it provides a little more character. Is there a way to treat that? Could you still use it and treat it somehow so it would be uniform and or? I mean, we, it's so, um, to, it's not, it's the split face is not a maintenance issue per se. Okay. It just as, it's, it's more accurate to say, as you said, it, it just hasn't weathered well, weathered well, especially when you look at the base. So it's, it's got enough porosity that it grabs a hold of dirt and it hangs on to it, okay. right? And so that's, if you notice, the, the, the cast stone and the natural stone is a much smoother face. And so our feeling is trying to honor what's there, uh, material, you know, having the base, but having a, a material that uh, we feel will ultimately, years from now, visually hold up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schneer. Any final questions from the commission? Seeing none, we will move on to public comment. If there's anyone here from the public who would like to make comment on this, we did receive one public comment in advance of the meeting from a neighbor, um, Jim and Ann, Ann Wilson, who live adjacent to the, the school, who are very supportive and looking forward to watching some um, school events. So uh, we could read those into the record. Uh, the commission did have opportunity to review those prior to the meeting. Ms. Roush, do you want to read that into the record? Yes. Um, I just, as you mentioned, have a single comment from Jim and Ann Wilson at 4049 Blackthorn Lane. Uh, dear Ms. Mullinex, my wife and I live behind Scioto High School in Hawthorne Commons community. Our backyard faces the athletic fields with some trees as a buffer. We moved here last year and love it. We got the public notice today regarding some athletic building construction. We are not able to attend the hearing uh, on February 2nd, 2023, but want to get off a quick note that we have reviewed the drawings and information and we feel very positive about these additions. We are both retired and enjoy attending school events. This will add to our experience as well as that of our students and family, a win-win. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Roush. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'd like to invite anyone from the public who would like to make a comment on this case to come forward, state your name and address for the record um, for the commission this evening before we move on to deliberation. Anyone? Seeing none, we will close pu public comment and move forward into deliberation. Uh, Mr. Schneer, would you start us off this evening? Um, I'm fine with the uh, project. Um, with the conditions that staff recommends. Thank you, Mr. Schneer. Mr. Fishman? Fine with the two. I was kind of surprised we didn't hear from any neighbors. We only had the one positive thing, so the neighbors are happy with it. I'm happy with it. Thank you, Mr. Fishman. Mr. Suplak? Uh, I'm supportive. It's good and simple. Appl applaud the, uh, the Block S. I, I would continue to advocate openly. It's not a condition um, in any way, shape, or form, but continue to advocate for consideration of the landscape enough to break up those big, big, long walls. Thank you, Mr. Suplak. Mr. Way. I'm also in support of the application um, and the, the uh, conditions that staff has put forward here. Um, I thought a lot about the landscape plan and thinking about how it's basically foundation planting. Um, 
but you know this is a place where there's heavy traffic um, and I, I just worry that if you let the landscape get too informal that it might just get trampled so I think what's being proposed is appropriate and I think the variety of plant material is also appropriate thank you mr. Bay Ms. harder I'm also in agreement and um, also with the conditions um, I think it's a great opportunity for uh, Scioto High School and uh, I'm very supportive Thank you, Ms. Harder. Mr. Chinook. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's I think it's great. I, I like how you're uh, cleaning up the backstops. I think the area desperately needs it. I think the landscaping would would help tremendously. And I really appreciate you all taking the consideration to try to fit within the existing architecture and design of the school in that area. Thank you, Mr. Chinook. I also am supportive of the application. I think you did a great job, and we certainly appreciate the materials being brought forward. Those do help us when we're looking especially at the, the change from existing materials and the explanation as to the why. And thank you for being good stewards over the taxpayer's money, looking at that long-term cost and maintenance. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Prior to calling for a motion, I do want to ask one question of legal just on this first condition. Uh, it does say substantially similar. Uh, are you comfortable with the, the wording there? I just want to make sure that we're, we're covered with the language. I am comfortable with that. Thank you. All right. With that, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve amended final development plan with three conditions. Thank you, Mr. Supalak. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Fishman. Ms. Beal. Ms. Harder. Yes. Mr. Shanock? Yes. Yes. Mr. Way? Approve. Mr. Supalak? Yes. Ms. Call? Yes. Mr. Snare? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Beal. And thank you for joining us this evening. We certainly look forward to, to the new additions to the high school. All right, ladies and gentlemen, case two on our agenda this evening, Indus Bridge Street 22-172 CP. This is a concept plan. This application is a request for a review and approval of the concept plan for the construction of a mixed-use development consisting of five buildings, a hotel, a parking garage, office, and two residential buildings. The 6.29-acre site is zoned Bridge Street District, Scioto River neighborhood, and located north of John Shields Parkway, west of Mooney Street, south of Tuller Road, and east of Riverside Drive. Mr. Hounchell, I'll turn the time over to you for a case presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. Uh, before you tonight is a concept plan for the Indus Bridge Street project. This site is highlighted in yellow on your screen. Uh, it sits north of uh, Bridge Park, the Bridge Park development at the intersection of Riverside Drive and Toller Road, also Riverside Drive and John Shields Parkway. This is zoned Scioto River neighborhood and is currently a vacant site, as you can see from the existing conditions here. Uh, you can see the grand development uh, in the left photo, which is to the uh, east of the site. Uh, and you can also see some of the, the grade change as you move from Riverside Drive back towards the Grand, which is where Mooney Street will also be in the future. So the applicant was before the Planning Commission back in October to discuss an informal review. This was just an opportunity to present the, the project as an idea received some non-binding feedback, which they have since incorporated into the concept plan tonight. The concept plan is the first step in a three-step process, a three-step formal process. So tonight would require a determination of the concept plan. Uh, this step is, is provided and is required to create the framework for the development. Uh, so outlining the character and nature of the proposed development. So really what we're looking at tonight is more the open space locations, the building locations, the street network and how the streets are implemented, um, but also the feel and character here. Um, something that's also considered as well is the general massing of the buildings, which uh, we'll, we will touch on tonight. Uh, as stated, if, if an approval of a concept plan were granted tonight, the commission would see this project at least two more times with a preliminary and final development plan a stage. These stages uh, later on are where we finalize details about building, architecture, landscape, uh, what is located and programmed within the open spaces, uh, and also the streetscapes. So just to clarify tonight, there are no waivers being presented and being requested for approval. Uh, so 
anything that currently exceeds code would not be approved tonight. That would need to be approved at a future date, um, which I'll also touch on a little bit later as well. So shown on the screen is the Bridge Street District Street Network Map. Uh, this is a document that was approved back with the Bridge Street District Code. Uh, the site is highlighted by the star on the screen, uh, and this site is adjacent to Riverside Drive, Toller Road, John Shields Parkway, and the future extension of Mooney Street. Uh, you'll see centrally on this site, kind of where the star is located, there's a blue dashed line, and that's a proposed neighborhood street extension, which is going to be Longshore Street. Uh, this is an extension that was not contemplated when the study was done and when this document was approved and, and created. Uh, but it is welcome and accepted by, by staff and is supported as that extension does contribute uh, to the gridded nature of this area. And I should also mention as well uh, that because this is a new street addition, uh, in the future a traffic study would be required. Um, that timing of that has not been determined. Typically, if it's staying at a planning commission level, a traffic study would be required with the preliminary development plan stage. So at the latest, that's when that would be provided to staff. Additionally, this site is located in the Cider River neighborhood. Uh, this neighborhood has specific standards for the sites that are located in the image on the left, highlighted by the blue highlighted area. The intent of this district is to create a balanced mix of land uses where the developments create a comprehensive, comfortable, walkable street network. Um, Things that, that contribute to this are open spaces, open space nodes, and gateways, which are more entrances into developments, entrances into districts, uh, and those would be incorporated at future stages of this project. Uh, so the applicant will be required to provide design details for these elements as they move forward with the development. So to touch on some of the history of this case, as stated, this went uh, to the commission back in October of 2022 where they saw the site plan. This is an aerial uh, of what was presented back in October. Uh, just to touch on a few points that were discussed from the commission, uh, the commission was generally supportive of the proposed uses of the buildings. Uh, the inspirational character images, not the massing specifically, but the character images that were presented with uh, the packet, the concepts of the open spaces and how they were programmed, and then the pedestrian engagement along the streets. Uh, Planning Commission did generally uh, present their concerns about the mass and scale of the development of the block um, and just how, how large scale the buildings were on this size of lot. Uh, additionally, there was concern about the heights of the buildings, specifically the residential buildings, as they were originally about 11 and 10 stories, uh, roughly about 120 feet and 110 feet in height. Uh, and then the last thing to touch on is the parking garage and accessing the parking garage, but also accessing the site, as there are some constraints existing uh, surrounding the site that make it challenging to access. Some of the recommendations from that meeting were to update building locations, so the layout of some of the buildings, uh, specifically the residential in the northwest corner, which are the two leftmost uh, buildings shown on that image, and then uh, presenting a, a cohesive design that is consistent and complementary to the existing development in the area. Moving from that, as shown on the screen is the proposed aerial for this site. Uh, and some of the updates are listed on the screen. So we still have two residential buildings, an office building, a hotel, and a parking garage uh, on the 6.29 acre site. Some of the updates, which I'll touch on here, uh, there were site layout updates where the residential has been moved from the northwest corner and has been replaced with the office building, which now captures that intersection. And the two residential buildings have been moved further south along Riverside Drive. There have been massing updates to the residential buildings. Um, they are not designed specifically the same, but there are elements of the design that do complement each other, uh, which was something that was discussed at the previous meeting. There's also a connector between the two buildings, which creates more of a, a unified look. There was updates to the programming of the open space and then also a reduction in parking. So shown on the screen is the proposed site plan. Uh, the color-coded uh, images here showcase the uses of these buildings and where they're located now. You can see the update to the residential and office where the parking and hotel have remained the same in their locations. 
additionally to talk through is access, specifically along Mooney Street. The arrows indicate the access points as you are moving north and south on this future corridor. Uh, there's, this represents six access points. Uh, staff is concerned with the number of conflicting access points, and one of our recommendations is to look into consolidating these points so that they line up more with the grand, which has these access points established on the east side of the street. Uh, other things that staff would recommend considering is providing a different access or an additional access for the garage along Longshore Street. Um, this is something that would need to continue to be studied, whether it's possible or not, but that is something that staff is recommending. And then additionally, uh, recommending opportunities to reduce the size of the garage and the spaces in the garage. Uh, one way this could be accomplished is, is doing research um, and investigating potential shared parking opportunities within the district. And highlighted in black on the screen are the four open spaces provided. Uh, these open spaces equate to just over an acre, uh, which is which meets code uh, based on what's required with the uses here. Uh, and this is highlighted by the central about half acre open space located centrally on the site. Uh, this space has been reprogrammed since the last time you all saw it. Uh, so this now features more of an open space green with plaza space to the north and south of it along River, or Longshore Street. And the two images shown on the screen uh, highlight kind of the inspiration behind this. So it, it has a massive green open space with the uh, landscaping walkways both to the north and south. And then you still have the zigzagged ADA access on the, the eastern half of the site, which is required to jump the grade up to Mooney Street. So we'll just talk through each of the buildings first and then talk about the scale and massing of it comprehensively at the end here. Uh, so the proposed office building is shown on the screen. This is at the northwest corner of the site at Toller and Riverside. This is a corridor style building. All buildings are corridor as proposed, except for the garage. This is a six story, 91 foot tall building with first floor commercial. The hotel is at the southeast corner at John Shields Parkway and Mooney Street. This is an eight story, 111 foot tall, as measured on Longshore Street building, uh, 94 feet on Mooney Street, as the grade does eat up quite a bit into this uh, building. Next is the northernmost residential building. So this is located centrally on the site on the west side of uh, Longshore Street. This is a nine story building, 108 foot tall uh, residential structure that is connected to the southern residential building, which is eight stories and 99 feet in height. Uh, as you can see on, on the left side of the image, uh, there is a massing, as a, a connector corridor between these two buildings that is roughly uh, just, just not as deep it, uh, as the two residential buildings, but it is does occupy quite a bit of the depth here. And then underneath that uh, is an open space. So this does not extend to the ground. It is elevated about three or four stories above grade. And then there's also residential amenities on the above the first floor of the commercial space, which you can see the, the box centrally on the screen. That would be more of a pool deck, pool amenity for the residents there. And finally, the proposed parking structure, which is five stories, 74 feet tall along Longshore Street. Uh, this has first floor and second floor commercial. The second floor commercial is only on Toller, uh, and that's to also move up with the grade here. So looking at the development comprehensively, uh, the left image shows the I-270 perspective looking southeast. Uh, so you can also see some of the massings of existing buildings out in Bridge Park compared to the building that is provided here. And then also on the right is Longshore's perspective as you're looking north from Bridge Park, uh, Block D. So staff would, would acknowledge that there have been changes to, to this plan that align with uh, the concerns of the commission previously um, by moving, relocating some of the buildings, reducing some of the height, uh, although it should still be noted that the buildings, specifically the two residential buildings and the hotel, would still be the largest buildings in this development, um, but also in this sector along Riverside Drive. Um, so considering the, the comments from the commission previously and some of the concerns that staff still has regarding the massing of the buildings and some of the heights, uh, we would encourage and, and recommend that the applicant continue to explore opportunities to reduce the massing of these buildings, but also 
uh, contemplate the heights of these buildings as well to correlate with what is anticipated, what's expected within this district, um, but also correlating with what is uh, existing just south of here in Bridge Park. Additionally, uh, staff would recommend that the applicant ensure that there's unique high quality architecture that is provided with these. Those would be provided at a preliminary development plan stage and final development plan. And finally, regarding the garage, uh, finding opportunities to activate the north elevation. So the applicant is proposing that second story commercial, which is great. Uh, but since that is also a principal frontage street, there is additional emphasis that is needed for that street along with John Shields Parkway to the south. And just to share, and I'm happy to come back to this as needed throughout the presentation and throughout our discussion tonight, but shown on the screen is a massing comparison of the stories proposed, the height of the buildings, total height, uh, and then some of the approved buildings in Bridge Park. So this is not a comprehensive comparison. There are more than six buildings out there, but we pulled some of these as they are either along Riverside Drive or they are more landmark um, or more significant structures that have been approved out there. Um, the AC Hotel was approved for a waiver for height, but that does not capture the entire story. For these, something that is not shown here is that some buildings did receive approvals for story heights. Um, so the heights of the buildings may still seem within reach, but some of the heights of the stories themselves were um, granted waivers. So that is not depicted here, just something to consider as we move forward. So staff has reviewed this concept plan to the applicable criteria and are recommending approval of the concept plan with the nine conditions shared here on the screen, many of which around access, the garage access, Mooney Street, uh, building massing and heights, and architecture. With that, I am happy to answer any questions there may be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hounchel. Uh, with this application, we're going to handle questions separate from the applicant and staff. So looking to the commission for questions specific to staff at this time for Indus. Mr. Way. Thank you. Um, I was curious. Um, I was looking at the, the, the rest of the blocks in Bridge Park, and I was looking specifically at the parking garages. And I think almost all the parking garages have at least two sides that have liner buildings on them, but they're not consistent. So I think the ones closest to the hotel are on Longshore Street, and then the ones, the other blocks going to the north are on Mooney Street. Is, was there any, I don't, was there any rationale to that evolution of one liner buildings with garages and two, what street was a priority to put a liner building on? So throughout the development of that, a lot of it's dictated on the category of street as well when you're looking at where you're accessing um, a lot of those parking garages. So typically the least prioritized street is where you'll find those accesses. Um, there is one garage which only has one access. I think that's the one that's above North Market. And I think that's because they have liner buildings on the east and north sides of it. So there's also less parking there. Um, I don't have the number specifically, but that's usually something that drives that. Um, but it was also just the type of product that they were proposing to screen the garage. Um, so they provided those liner residential buildings there. So regarding this project, um, you know, that's something I don't, I would probably look to Dave and his team to speak towards, but hasn't been contemplated yet. So it looks like there's you know, more garage than the others, even though the buildings may be similar in size. So, so I would just, uh, I guess, building on what you just said, I just comment that the, the two newer buildings have the liner building on Mooney Street. So there was a trend of lining Mooney Street with development. And the other point I wanted to make that um, all of the garages except the one by the hotel are basically 270 feet long, which is a pretty standard garage dimension. So I just wanted, I'm saying that for the commission in terms of how we, this, this, the garage that's being proposed here is much longer than that, much bigger than that. Thank you, Mr. Way. Other questions from the commission? Uh, Mr. Hanshaw, could I have you bring back uh, page 17? 
Can you clarify the upper section is Indus, the application that we're looking at for concept plan this evening. The lower one uh, has existing approved parcels. Um, are all of those like uses to the Indus buildings? Yes, I believe a majority of these are the corridor buildings, which encode those are the tallest buildings that you can build, uh, highest densities that you can build. I believe most of these are that. Um, they Do are. any of them have parking structures? Uh, are any of them parking structures? None of them are parking structures. No, these are all either mixed use or office buildings. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission for staff at this time? Mr. Chinock. Ever real quick, when you mentioned the traffic study, if the Longshore, Longshore Street extension happens to Tuller, are we doing a traffic study regardless of what happens here? If the anticipated densities are larger than what we have analyzed, because when, when this district was created, there was a traffic study that was done comprehensively throughout the entire district. If something exceeds what is anticipated, then a traffic study is usually required. Um, or if there's a street connection that is not contemplated, that is something that's required. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hounshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chinock. Final call for questions for uh, Ms. Harder. Just a quick uh, question about sidewalks. Um, when do you have often uh, businesses come back to you and ask about dining opportunities on sidewalks? And is that something that um, takes some time to get or uh, just thinking about that, the size of the sidewalks? Sure. Uh, so something that is, I guess, from existing experience south of here, um, the city has entered into some agreements for right of way encroachments. Um, not all of the buildings south are built out to the property line. Several of them are, so we do run into those issues. Um, but that is a mechanism that we have engaged with before and we're used to. Um, so the process would be relatively similar, would be my guess. Mr. Way. Um, I remember in the last meeting we talked about the fact that this is a large block, longer block than the rest of the Bridge Park blocks. And the consideration of a mid-block um, entrance off of Riverside Drive was not deemed to be. I, I can't remember exactly what the what we were we discussed, but I wondered is is there any is there any reason or are there any value in a connect, a mid-block connection here that would go from Longshore to Riverside Drive, and a, it would obviously be a right in right out because you can't break the median, but. And you're talking vehicular? Yeah, vehicular, yeah. That, I, was that at all discussed at, by staff or, and just everybody's fine with the, the configuration without an, a mid-block entrance? Sure. So through, through our discussions and working with the applicant, um, one connection that we did consider and that they considered was a connection from Longshore to Mooney Street. And that would have been right through where the park is currently provided. Um, the reason that that is not provided now is because the significant grade that you have to achieve to get up to Mooney was too challenging to accomplish. Um, I can, I would hope I'm speaking correctly for Tina here, but um, the layout in which this is currently provided is more suited for what the district wants. Uh, we're not providing, we're trying to minimize the amount of contact points on Riverside Drive. So I would say we probably would not want or anticipate any connections on the Riverside Drive other than what's existing out there. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that all sounds great. I'm Tina Waskowitz with the Division of Transportation Mobility. Thanks for asking. And as you know, Riverside Drive is a principal frontage street, so we would not allow a driveway to intersect, but it, we could develop a, a public street. It's not required by the street uh, network by code. So they have proposed this, which meets the street network um, and actually adds that north-south connection that's not not shown in the uh, code right now. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that and make sure that everybody was understanding that that's not something that we're moving forward with. So, Thank you, Mr. Way. Sir, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, Mr. Would, would, would staff be supportive if long, long shore that extension was 
maintenance only and it was closed for automotive traffic whereas more pedestrian friendly thoroughfares you know i mean we still have maintenance allowable but since it's not being used for the garage or any um residential activity so more of a pedestrian oriented street correct so that is something that has been discussed um ultimately the currently where we're at is showing a full access where vehicular can come through um, that would need to be studied more um, just because there are specific requirements that we have for public streets um, if it were private that would be on the developer to maintain and do so so um, at the moment it's hard to say but certainly something that we have discussed thank you mr Hilchel. ms harder i was just thinking about riverside and the cars that are parked along Riverside. Do you take action about how many cars can be, um, uh, you know, parking along there? And if you feel like after the traffic study, it needs to be reduced or something of that sort? So is the question how, I guess, is there a maximum on how much parking you can put on Riverside? So a lot of it's dictated by the minimum required size of parking bays um, for parallel parking. A lot of that is what dictates it, but also how far away you need to be from an intersection. So I, I wouldn't say there's there's a maximum based on the width and the and the, the length of it. I just don't know those at the at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Hanshaw. Final questions from the commission? Mr. Fishman. Quick ones. Um, um, I, I can't remember why we did we ask to reduce the parking? We didn't uh, ask to reduce the parking, did we? No. Okay, so there, there was, I, I, there was. I thought you mentioned we asked. If we, I, I couldn't find that in the minutes. Um, my concern is that right now, before these buildings are being built uh, in Bridge Park, there's uh, problems with delivery. If you've driven a lot down there, you'll see trucks double parked on the street, uh, and so, um, and 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 they're right beside somebody that's. Parked. I had to wait to get out of a parking spot not too long ago because a big truck was delivering to one of the restaurants. So, um, uh, I, 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 at this point, wouldn't unless you can convince me, wouldn't be in favor of reducing the parking. I think we, I'd like to see less parking on the street, at more places where people can deliver. I mean, there's going to be restaurants. There's people moving in and out of apartments and and so on. And if you drive down there any weekday, you'll see parks. Cars double parked on the street. You have to go in the wrong lane to get around them. So, uh, can you tell me about that? Or sure. Um, so, looking back to the discussion that we had back in October, I wouldn't say there was a consensus on reducing parking. Okay. Uh, what what there, what, the, but there was discussion of it. Um, what they're currently providing meets the minimum required parking for what they're providing. Um, so there's no parking plan that would be required. They, they wouldn't have to reduce. Um, ultimately, what our staff is recommending is that due to the footprint of this building, it, is, it appears to be larger than what's currently out there. So are there opportunities to study how the current parking garages out there are operating, what capacity they're at, and are there opportunities to create some sort of shared parking agreement so that may create opportunities to reduce the footprint of the building and allow for more open space, allow for better um, streetscape engagement, something to consider. Um, whether that happens or not, that's up to the study, but, and whether that is a condition that is, is approved. And, and if I might jump in about the curbside, um, the loading, unloading, we are in the process or transportation mobility is um, planning is engaged in the conversation as well about curbside management. So getting a better handle on these instances where loading and unloading is taking place and how that, how that can be managed more holistically and more efficiently. So we already are addressing that and the specifics of how that would be handled with this site. When we get to some more detailed subsequent stages, we'll definitely make sure that's accounted for as this moves forward. I appreciate that, but I, I, I think that uh, it's going to be hard to get a handle on it because if a guy's got to deliver something and, and there's no parking, he's going to park double parked. I mean, you see it down there now. I mean, you can you can say he can't do it, but you can. The, the other question I had, um, I'm sure Washington 
been notified that will they be are they prepared to handle nine story buildings if, if if for some reason this was approved you talked to washington township we have discussed this project with them um at multiple iterations so that is certainly something they are aware of with the height of buildings that they're they're showing um one of the the challenges with longshore street is if you were to make it specifically for the office and residential buildings, there has to be a level of service that they can access and operate if there were to be something on the ninth story. Um, I know that's something that we had a couple months back with one of the other buildings, and that was a challenge because there was a lot happening um, on the street. So certainly something they're aware of, and they would absolutely be consulted through, through all this to make sure that they can service it. Okay. One other thing. It's my notes here. Okay. We, what? What? Okay, um, we, we talked since the beginning of Bridge Street about walkable community, and these buildings are are, are huge, and and walking around them is going to be difficult. It's not going to encourage people to walk. I think uh, the size of these buildings, uh, you got to walk a long way to get around the building, and so on. I appreciate the pass through. That's going to help a little bit. That that's a, that was a concern for me. So. The emergency was a concern. The parking was a concern because uh, we've included, I noticed in my material, that we include the street parking as part of the code, uh, as part of their allowance. And uh, I, I think that's going to be a hardship. Mr. Fishman, did you have a question on the, the walkability of it? Yeah, I, that, that was my question. So, yeah. Mr. Henschel, can you talk to staff's perspective on the walkability of the particular area, specifically speaking to the larger format buildings of the parking garage? Sure. Uh, so part of part of what we look at is, and that actually ties in a little bit to the parking structure um, comment that we all have, is when you have large-scale buildings, you limit the amount of pedestrian access and accessibility as you move throughout the site. So one thing that we do look at is one, the footprint of buildings and two, the, the open spaces and how accessible they are, but also how does everything flow throughout the district and how does it connect to the existing network outside of what's being built here? Um, so those are definitely things that we consider um, and will consider if this were to move forward to a preliminary and final development plan stage. Thank you, Mr. Henschel. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Henschel, I have a couple. Uh, looking at Bridge Street District Neighborhood Standards, uh, page 42, well, really, going into the building tables, can you call out specifically the building types that these would fall into and the permitted height for each of the building types according to the code? Yes, I can do that. So. Uh, corridor buildings, which would be the purple, red, and orange, those would all be classified as corridor buildings. And in our code, uh, corridor buildings have their own specific requirements. The maximum story height, not number height, would be six stories. Um, the height of the first floor, try this from memory, is 12 to 16. Is 16. 12 to 16, minimum height 12, Correct. maximum heat six, maximum height 16. Correct. And then all upper floor would be a max of 14 feet. So the absolute max a building could, could be is about 86 feet. Um, so that's not considering the building code sections of it where specific uses have requirements on, on their ceiling height, but that's, that's the maximum of what this code allows for corridor. Um, I believe the parking structure... Let me flip to that. I have it here if you'd like me to. That would be great. Yes. <laughs> so maximum height we have as five stories, ground story minimum eight to 12, maximum 18 foot. That's again for the ground story. Upper stories are eight and a half, maximum height 12. Now I'm looking at uh, requirements of parking structure shall be met. So it references code 153.065B5. So 
pulling out calculator. So maximum height would be about 66 feet. Thank if, you. Yep. All right. Any final questions for staff at this time? Thanks for asking that. I was going to ask that. Certainly. All right. Uh, with no further questions for staff, thank you, Mr. Hounschel. We reserve the right to re-engage uh, with you. We'd like to turn the time over to the applicant. If you have a presentation this evening, we'd like to invite you up. Otherwise, we will start firing away questions. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, David Kozar with Indus Companies, Indus Hotels, uh, 1555 Lenox Town Lane, Columbus, Ohio, uh, 43212. Zach, great job. I, you know, I was kind of going through my notes of what to talk and, and really, I think everything's pretty much been said. But, um, you know, we look at this development, you know, early on and, and we did, we pushed and pulled so much. The site has some constraints. It's a skinnier site. It's a narrower site. Um, it's a steeper site, you know, than, than most any that have been uh, developed in the neighborhood thus far. So we really had a challenge um, with how to best lay this um, site out as we looked at it. You know, I think the continuation of the neighborhood to the north and really creating a north anchor that had something unexpected, something different than what you see below. Below's great, but we just thought something special, something different. The park is the open area is really the heart of it um, and what we're doing. And, and we had great comments the first time. And I think everyone can attest, you know, I think the activation of that is very important. And I think we'll see through tonight that we, we've, we've done a lot of that uh, and listened to a lot of that. The pushing of the buildings around, I think, uh, afforded us some, uh, some things that we were able to take advantage of too. I think we had two bridges before. Um, you know, we're now one bridge from the parking garage into the residential. A lot of that does drive from the fact that that second building is so far away. Um, and we really picked up cues from some of you before too. And I don't know if we have a photo of that tonight when we did some um, concepts or inspirational things, we kind of had that building with the pass through through it, which was really, really, we loved it. I know a number of you guys did, so we really are kind of playing on that. We know we aren't at an architectural detail level now where it, but, but I think that is was well, kind of an inspiration on, man, we can really look at this differently and really make that a gateway type feature, even though it's not on the corner, but to really let that building be unique in that way. Um, and it does open up then to that park uh, uh, that we have you know, behind there. So I'll leave it at you know, that. I think there'll be a lot of questions and I'll let the professionals here do the presentation on this. But um, you know, I'll say one other thing, you know, the retail, uh, commercial space on the first floor is very important and the connectivity of the neighborhood is very important. Um, we know we have a median, we know we have a vehicular uh, disconnection. Uh, you can't drive through to this northern neighborhood like you can in all the other ones. Um, but we have talked about and are working on making sure we have that pedestrian connection there at Longshore. It's very, very critical. And to your point, Ms. Harder, we are planning on actually stepping some buildings back to allow for some outdoor seating, especially at that key entryway into our development, because I think we want to invite, make it feel like it's coming to some activity. And then we get drawn into that activity zone in the park area and really let that be the hub and the heart of, of everything. There will be some discussion, I know, on the parking garage. We have looked at accessing it through, uh, uh, through Longshore. There's some benefits to that, obviously, but it just doesn't lay out well, and it really wipes out a lot of parking spaces, and it really takes out the commercial space, which is important, because the commercial space is what's going to set the tone as people are walking down the street, you know, and, and having that on both sides of the street continuing through is, is vitally important, especially as we're wrapping and introducing something on, on Tuller uh, as well. So I'll leave it at that. I'll let the professionals here take over and... Miguel Gonzalez, uh, 300 Spruce Street, and that's 43215. Uh, good evening. Hello again. Um, I think Zach did a great job uh, going through the major uh, items that we addressed since last we met. Uh, but I would like to add a few things. And Zach, I don't know if you can go to the package, the conceptual, and go to the uh, site plan. The uh, Let's see. The landscape plan, sorry. So 
So um, one of the other items that we really looked at closely was kind of increasing the retail presence along that open space, the central space, you know, the heart of the development in order to really activate uh, something we talked about um, extensively, I think, last time. Uh, so we've tried to make it more porous, a little more accessible, also increase uh, just, I think, the reshuffling of the building locations helped us realign views into that space, which I think creates a third gateway in a sense. It's not technically doubling gateway, but it functions, functions as such. Um, the other thing we did was add uh, this connector, the residential connector above the, uh, between the two residences, and we think that actually allows for a really great opportunity for amenities on the roof of that space as well. Uh, we addressed the gateway locations, so um, along John Shields, really treating it with open space architecture and really more architecturally at the north at Tuller. And then finally, if you could go to the uh, next to last page, um, we, I think that shows uh, some of what we did on the uh, on the garage, but also just to reiterate that we tried to add activation at that Teller Street um, facade, you know, taking some of that garage at the first floor all the way along Teller. So, you know, essentially you have a two-story retail space, commercial space at uh, Longshore and Teller intersection. Um, with that, I'm happy to entertain questions. Um, I did want to add one more thing that you know, the height of the buildings, we understand that's going to require waivers, and it's really a balance, you know, because we think that having this great open space that attracts people to the area is a really great amenity. And so it really becomes a balance of, you know, site density, height versus, you know, being able to actually achieve this uh, by not having a, you know, again, one, another open space that's kind of smaller in scale, but something that's really special. So. Thank you. All right, looking to the commission for questions for the applicant, we will hold our deliberation until after we hear public comment. Mr. Sneer. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Could you speak to the connector? Um, is it, so? I know we're not at materials, is it? So part of the strategy, before we get into materials, part of the strategy with the connector was, you know, we talked about reducing height, and that was one of the biggest things that we tried to achieve was really the height reduction on the north and south residential buildings. Um, so adding the connector was a way to still meet, you know, our clients' performa, make the numbers work, and um, achieve uh, a certain degree of still openness. We have connected buildings, but we tried to reduce the width. We tried to actually you know, open the space at the ground level and not take the connector all the way to the roof line so that it really feels like kind of an in-between element. Smaller in scale, uh, we think this could be very transparent, translucent, have a more degree of um, you know, uh, glazing to it. And like I said, it also provides uh, some great opportunities for amenities um, at the roof line. So. I'm trying to visualize. It, it will be literally a connector floor by floor. It's a connector. Part of what happened when we reshuffle the buildings, uh, if you re recall, we had the you know north residential, south residential at the north, at kind of middle positions along Riverside. Uh, both of those had bridge connectors to the garage to you know provide that amenity to residents to be able to you know get to the garage in a covered space. When we moved the buildings, we lost that ability to connect both. So adding the connector was a way to get that connectivity back um, between the residential and the garage. Can, well. can you speak to the actual contents? You know, we see the the footprint of the building. We see the connector. It is wider than multiple stories. So can you speak to the actual internals? It's actually, uh, units. So we have a mix. I believe we had two uh, bedroom and one bedrooms uh, and maybe studios in that connector. I don't know if we have a representative plan, upper level plan. Um, we don't. But it's essentially going to be uh, residential units in that connector. Okay. Within that, a, and that's what space so, so a resident from the south building wouldn't be able to use this to get to the north building? They would. I mean, essentially, that corridor connects both buildings. 
you know, it's a common corridor between north, south, and the connector. That connects okay. all three. So the and then you have units on either side. So you have units that uh, look towards Riverside, and you have units that look towards um, uh, the open space so as well. Drilling down here. Um, so the units will face east and west. That's correct. What, so if you were looking from Riverside, you said there'd be a lot of glazing. Theoretically, you'd be looking into somebody's apartment. Or we would be looking at apartments, essentially. And when I say a lot of glazing, obviously we have you know right. considerations. But uh, the the idea is to make it a light mm -hmm. um, element. But you wouldn't see you wouldn't see through it because you wouldn't see through it because you have units on either side. You have units yeah. on the other side and a hallway between. Exactly. It would, and it would be from. How, how many stories is? So this would go from the third story. Uh, we really studied this uh, to try to achieve kind of multiple things that, you know, with this one element. Um, so it starts at the third floor. So we tried to get that double height experience at the ground floor so it felt more open to the outside and the open space. Uh, and then we take it up to the seventh floor. So I live on the, let's see, the top floor of the south residence. And so I park in the garage and I'm in the northeast corner. How do, and, and how do I get my groceries? You would enter the bridge at, um, I believe it's the fifth floor, and you would actually make your way through and then take the elevator. You know, you can make it all the way through the south building and take the elevator to the top floor if you're on the top floor. And then cross through the connector? Yes. Long way. Cross through the connector on whatever floor you're on and then go, in this case, I said the top floor. So, right. And then go up from there. That's correct. Um, I mean, you obviously have given thought to that. It, um, it seems like a long way for you, but... That you study it, it that does, and I think uh, I mean obviously it's more uh, you know more distance than we had previously, but I think that overall um, the site strategy does work better, and I think uh, that was one of the uh, directives or one of the things we talked about was to really look at not having the residential at the north corner. Um, so that was one way to still achieve that connectivity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schneer. Mr. Way. Can I ask a, a follow-up to the, I mean, we're obviously interested in the connector. I noticed in the South building, you show a trash compactor or some kind of a service, you know, that you can actually back into, Yes. but you don't for the North building. Is it intended that the connector allows those buildings to function like one building and they're, and they're using the same, it does. you're not duplicating it, services. That is essentially the idea. Yeah. And very similar to um, what we did to the South where we would have a single, you know, point of collection. Uh, for that block, but typically, ex excluding maybe office and hotel. Okay. Yeah. You want me to keep going, or yes, Mr. Way. So um, I guess move the move from the connector to uh, the parking garage. I, I I just was curious. I mean, you've lowered the height of the of the res of the buildings generally. You've used the connector to pick up some density. Had you considered um, using any kind of liner buildings around the garage to actually offset building height and units and pick them up elsewhere on the? So we really did. Uh, we uh, worked extensively with staff uh, to look at several alternatives. Probably they didn't see all of them, but we did study that um, in terms of liners, location, access. Um, and again, it's that balance of being able to maintain this very special space that we're trying to create with the open space. Um, I, I think that's the more more direct answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Way. Mr. Chinook. Um, I have a couple of questions. So last time you were all in here, we talked about, um, and, you, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, just kind of uh, as this being like that kind of last big element of the whole, you know, Long River Long River side of the development. And it's, like we mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a very large parcel. What, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about your vision for this space? How, how's it going to be different than what's already there? Can, you started talking to it like the commercial. Maybe it's more retail, less restaurant. Um, the park, obviously, is really nice. I think it's, it's nice how you've laid that out. 
uh, why it's a little hidden. It would be, you know, if we get more access to Riverside from that. But can you, can you just expand a little bit, like, how this is special, how this, how this is going to be different than what's already out there? I think I'll ask my colleague, John, to maybe uh, walk us through that space a little bit. Good evening, uh, John Woods, MKSK 462 South Ludlow Street. Um, was the question pertaining to the open space or the character of the architecture? All, all of it. So, I, I, I mean, again, the open space is great, but it's it, just trying to get a little deeper into your vision for this this area because it is so critical and so important. And obviously, you've got a, you know, we'll talk a lot about scale in a minute, but you know, we just want to understand a little bit more. If you could just expand on the the, the vision for the overall space sure i can speak more to the the ground level open space because i'm a landscape architect so um one of the things that we did change from last time we were with you uh, with respect to the larger open space uh, previously the ada access kind of split the open space in two halves north and south and it's still uh, negotiated the grade from Mooney Street to Longshore Street. So what we've done here is split the open space east and west. The east half with the ADA access is um, there are terraced um, seating areas on that side off of the ADA pathways that zigzag down the site. The lower half on the west is all basically at the Longshore Street elevation and takes advantage of all the commercial space in the hotel to the south and in the parking garage to the north. So the, we expanded the um, commercial space in the garage and the hotel to further activate that open space. And so right adjacent to those spaces is a more paved area with plant beds such as what you're seeing in the bottom right image, uh, benchmark image there to allow for seating, people to spill out into the landscape, tables and chairs, that sort of thing. And then in the center, we've created a central open space that could be programmed with uh, live music, um, yoga, um, lawn sports, those sort of things. And that's somewhat represented, represented by the image um, above the right. So that's kind of how that space is programmed. And um, at least right now, we don't know what, you know, the program is going to be in the architecture, but that's what's feeding that. So what's great about this, I think I mentioned this last time, is we we have a lot more space between buildings here. So we have a lot more opportunity to do interesting things with plant material. So we have more sun. Um, the other two open spaces are differentiated. Um, we're always trying to, even what we did in the south in Bridge Park, um, here at Bridge, Indus Bridge Street, we're also trying to make these open spaces different from one another. So, you know, we have a small lawn space that's underneath that connector that would um, support um, lounging and um, lawn games and that sort of thing, and the connection to uh, Riverside Drive. The open space to the north with all the circular elements, uh, that is seen as a more a uh, bold statement with trees coming up out of out of uh, landscape circular landscape beds that have seating wrapped around them. So we're really trying to provide variety throughout um, this area, and we've also identified a lot of areas. You can see tables and chairs where we're trying to anticipate activating at sidewalk level, where what's inside the buildings can spill out onto the sidewalk. So cafe seating and that sort of thing. Thank you, Mr. Chinook. Mr. Wade, did you? That, yep. Mr. Woods, um, I, I think you were getting at the character of Longshore Street as well as the park spaces. And in the last meeting, you all had talked about maybe the street would be different than the rest of Ridge Park. Maybe there wouldn't be curbs. Um, have you diverged from that idea? And it's, this is going to look just like the rest of Longshore Street. We talked about the kind of no curb idea. Um, I think that's something that needs further study and further conversations with uh, staff, traffic. Uh, I think there's several um, elements uh, that would go into that um, that do need to be looked at a little more. Thank you, Mr. Way. And I'll answer a little bit 
to what you mentioned too, you know, so that's, I mentioned that streetscape and the ground level is very important and don't get caught up on like where those elevators are and the stairwells and those things that'll need to change dramatically on for what you're seeing here. The intention is to continuation and letting Longshore be the predominant um, pedestrian traveled retail frontage restaurants. Um, we're looking to nod maybe a little more upscale here in this development, if, if you were to ask what, I don't have tenants, you know, none of that, but we are working with retail consultants and, and we'll continue to do that as we play out with this because it's very important, you know, what, what's worked, what's not worked, you know, in the, in, in, in the neighborhood to the south, what are some things we can enhance uh, here? Um, and I think there are opportunities there and, and we want to take, take advantage of those, so we will. Thank you. Mr. Suplak. Um, just to carry on with that sort of line of conversation, you just you just touched on it a little bit. I, I had a whole, um, I suppose it's a curiosity about how do your commercial spaces at present, right? Currently, they look like they're already cut up in shells. May or may not be the case. May or may not, may or may not hold water by the time it all, all shakes out and you have tenants who are interested. But relative to these shells, I, we've heard a couple a couple thoughts about, and, and maybe Mr. Way is the one who actually articulated it today, but I think we might have touched on it last time. Not that we're advocating one way or another, but is it a little more retail? Um, is it a little less restaurant? Is uh, are these are these shells comparable? They're already cut up, uh, at least on with you know CAD CAD lines. Um, are they comparable to what's down the street? Is there anticipation that, listen, you'll go to market and see who bites and see how it shakes out relative to all that? I do see that a couple of them, depending on where you find them in the drawings, right? The two that are, I think, on the hotel in particular are designated as restaurants already. Um, again, just on one page, they're commercial. On another page, they're... Yeah, that's stuff. just misrepresentation. Price. We tried to make it uniform and just say commercial. We don't know today exactly where, but we, we want a good, healthy mix of all that. We want a healthy mix of restaurant. We want a healthy mix of retail. We want a healthy mix of service. And it really is a... There's an art to that as well, the science in doing that right. And so it's not... You know, it's, it's talking to the right tenants. And a lot of times getting the right tenants brings another tenant or two along with it too. A lot of those guys pair together. And so... When I say there's consultants out we will be using someone who will help address and try to tenant this. It is an entertainment district. That's what we have retail-wise, a lot of restaurants and stuff, and we can't, um, we're not the tail wagging the dog. It is. We're going to continue that a little bit through there, but I think we can add some other elements to it that are missing uh, in, in the blocks to the south, and that's our intention. So, And just to add to that, you know, it is early, so these things are in flux. Yeah. But... That being said, we did look at the hotel as a really ideal location for something like a restaurant um, and purposely uh, really tried to you know, plan ahead for that by providing also wider sidewalk space uh, for outdoor seating and things of that nature. And, and relative to, forgive me, I'm going back to the, the shells as they're drawn. A couple of them, again, the, two, the, the few near the hotel are obvious you have them separated by you know a thoroughfare going between them but some of the other ones is well are, yeah and you, can, you can even see in the middle residential one the elevators don't line up where the bridge comes across uh -huh. so don't I, I that's why i say okay. have them wipe out what it shows there Duly really noted. well and that's what i was looking for uh, yeah. in part a uh, conversation on the need to be pulled into what the building. We're showing and how does that work relative to what's down the street because there are some small rather small facilities down the street that, and that rhythm as you're walking down the street as opposed to, you know, walking the length of yeah, the front I think, of Target, for instance. Yeah, I think our buildings, if you look at and Zach, you know that the square footage of the ground levels are very similar to what the ground floor of the buildings are up down the street, if I'm but, not mistaken. I mean, it would be much different. And, and to the garages as well, I was looking at those. Our garage is about an average size footprint uh, to the other ones. And size-wise, I think they range from... I had it over there. I think 880 is the biggest one, 850, ours is 800, and then another one goes down to like 650 or something like that. So the size of our garage parking-wise, the footprints, I think most of them are circular with a, a three-stack lane within it, very efficient garages. So the footprint of the garage is very similar, but yes, because of the size of our site, we aren't able to get a wrap on one of the sides or any. We looked at it at various ways, and it just 
it just doesn't fit. You know, our site's just too right. too narrow. Forgive me. Second second question on um, floor plans. Right again, recognizing it is early. Um, that said, and, and I'm I'm asking as much as anything else. There's a few of your these masses that clearly have right the internal layout of units or the internal layout of hotel rooms is driving the external demeanor of the massing already. Is that is that at this point, and obviously it's still fluid, subject to subject to refine, but are what we seeing here um, the likely sort of plus or minus output of those floor plans? I think that in terms of the floor plates, you know, while I, I would say that they're generically unit layouts and they're generically, I think the hotel is probably the most specific yeah, um, because of the, the, the hotel brand that we're carrying. As far as the units, I think there's a lot of development still to be done as far as exterior massing as it relates to balconies and the unit layouts and those will continue to evolve. Yeah. Uh, at this point, we have a unit mix that we're achieving, but it's not, it's not yet there, you know. Duly noted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supalak. Mr. Fishman. Yeah, uh, I, I apologize, but can I ask a question of staff? Yep. Okay. Um, uh, we just heard uh, the mention that they were thinking about asking for a waiver to get this giant height. Um, uh, and and uh, how much are they exceeding the green space requirement in the Bridge Park? I remember being on that committee, and there's, a, there's very strict uh, uh, conditions as far as the how, how, for this uh, parcel, how much uh, uh, green space they're required? So what is required, and I'll pull this up. This was not pre provided in the plan. It was provided in the packet, um, but not in the presentation. So this chart here displays what's required with open space. Um, they're required to provide 0 0.92 acres. They're providing 1.06. So they are exceeding it by about 0.14. So not much. It's not double the space. Right? We're, we're point what? It's about 0 0.4 acres. Um, so I don't, I don't know what that comes out to square footage wise, but they are exceeding what's required. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll hold the rest of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fishman. Uh, staff, do we contemplate a, a building connector that is building location? Do we have that anywhere contemplated in the Bridge Street area plan, the neighborhood plan, the land development code? And you're speaking specifically to the connector between the residential buildings? Uh, the connector that is essentially a building right. in between two buildings that is attached to two buildings. I can't think of an instance where we've had a building that's done that. Um, we would need to go back and look at how we would analyze that, but I don't, I don't have an answer at the moment. Um, yeah, we can provide that in a future stage. Thank you, Mr. Hanschel. Other questions from the commission for either staff? Ms. Harder. Uh, just quickly, I'm thinking about that, um, you know, you need ample uh, space for outdoor dining that doesn't infringe on pedestrians walking and, and kind of being ahead of the game so it's not a second thought, second look. Can you speak to that a bit about just outside? And, and when I'm thinking about the beginning of this, it's all about the walkability and people being out and about. And, and you have different places that you're looking at that we're not sure where. So that could be on Riverside. That could be on many of the streets kind of uh, enhancing. Thank you. Sure. Um, so you will see on the plans, um, on the site plan, the landscape plan, indicated in several areas, tables and chairs around the corners of buildings. Um, all along the longshore frontage of the hotel, We've set the building back to anticipate um, patio space there. So we, that would not encroach in the sidewalk. That would be uh, uh, off the sidewalk outside the right of way there. And, the, and again, the open space uh, in the center 
can be fed from the north and south by dining coming out of those um, commercial spaces. So just to add to that, so outside like a restaurant, and then they want to put some dining out there that could be right around the sidewalks. Is that, are you leaving some extra space with that or? In most cases, yes. Yes. Yeah, there's, Mr. Space, there's plenty of space to walk on the sidewalk and have dining opportunities. Mr. Hanschel, can you speak specifically to encroachment, what the process would be if the, if an applicant wanted outdoor dining area in this specific area? Yeah, if if a building or if a, a tenant were to want to exceed past the building lines, um, that's something that they would inquire with our engineering department and enter into or, or negotiate a right-of-way encroachment. Um, that process would also be included. Typically, that's a project that's seen at our administrative review team. So typically, planning commission would not be involved with that. So a lot of patios that you currently see were approved through through ART in coordination with engineering as well. And then can you speak to minimum connectivity, uh, walkability, what is considered as the administrative review takes place? So what... What we typically consider if if the patio is is provided, um, just thinking back to a few examples, there, there's a minimum width that we need to have with sidewalks. Um, we've had some cases here at Planning Commission where they've had to modify um, existing landscape beds to meet a minimum width. Um, I think it varies based on wherever you're at, though. Good evening. Um, so with the, the, the development to the south, there was a separate development agreement that allowed for encroachments up to six feet. So that was utilized down within the bridge park development. So um, I would recommend you know this applicant showing where they're proposing encroachments as part of this process. Um, so that's understood at the beginning where those spaces are. Um, with the project going to city council, they'd have the opportunity to look at that and kind of vote on where those encroachments are. So that way we're not after the fact trying to figure out can we fit you know, a patio encroachment into the right of way because that does get into kind of that pedestrian access route and having sufficient width for pedestrians walking through a corridor. Thank you, Mr. Hendershaw. Just to uh, clarify and add to the conversation, most of the patios that we're showing on the plan now aren't encroaching into the right of way whatsoever. Thank you for the clarity. Final questions from the commission for either staff or the applicant before we enter into public comment. Seeing none, we will open the time for public to make comments. We have received a number of comments from people who were not able to attend, and I am going to trouble Ms. Roush to read those into the record so that we have them. Okay. So the first one, if I can get it to open, is, sorry, this was working. I tested it before. Just one second. I'm trying to find them. Sorry. I had them pulled up, and then it wasn't working. So the first one is from Joanne Bloom. Um, who I believe is actually uh, might be here tonight, but I'll read this comment. Um, her address is 180 Indian Run Road, or excuse me, Drive here in Dublin, Ohio, 43017. Uh, the comment is, this development project is overly dense in an already tightly developed space. Also, the buildings as planned exceed height restrictions for new construction. Please do not approve any variance on established standards as those variants will become increasingly the norm. As a long-term Dublin resident, I am very concerned about the rapidly increasing development in dense urban development for my community. There are now at least a dozen major projects in the works all within a mile of my house. Too much. The second comment is from Tammy and Brian Dutro at 3220 Lily Mark Court in Dublin, Ohio, 43017. Thank you for allowing us to submit comments. We have two concerns with this project, building height and increased traffic. 
our understanding when Bridge Park was built was that the buildings would only be six stories high. This, this proposal exceeds that, that limit. Most of the existing buildings are five stories and this proposal feels out of scale. The current traffic situation at 161 and 33 during morning and evening rush hours are very congested and usually the north direction gets backed up to Martin Road. We usually try to find another way out of the neighborhood into, in order to avoid the roundabout during rush hour. Adding additional offices, hotels, and residents will make the roundabout even busier. What considerations are being made for this additional traffic? Thank you for listening to our concerns. The next is from Robin Gilletti at 6449 Martin Place, Dublin, Ohio, 43017. Hi, my name is Robin Gilletti. I live at 4649 Martin Place in Dublin. My husband and I have lived in our home for two and a half years, and in that short time, we have really come to love what Dublin has to offer. I'm writing to you because I cannot be there in person tonight. I believe that if building height zoning is changed for the Indus Bridge Street project, there is a greater chance that future additions to the Bridge Park area will waive the building heights as well. If code limits building heights to six stories, all developers should build according to the code. If the Indus Bridge, excuse me, the Indus Bridge project does get passed, I ask that it be kept to the number of stories in the current zoning regulations. I'm concerned about a granted number of stories because I live behind future proposed buildings and construct and constructing too high may interrupt the in integrity of our neighborhood. I cannot be convinced that it is necessary for these developers to ask for a waiver or variance for additional stories. Our cul-de-sac backs up to an upcoming proposal for building additions to the Bridge Park area going south from 161 Roundabout. I realize this is in the beginning stages, but our neighborhood may be greatly impacted by these proposed additions. We are concerned about parking, density, safe pedestrian traffic, added traffic congestion to the area, and noise to name just a few. Also, our street is off of Martin Road, a street that gets a large amount of traffic. There are vehicle turning issues at Martin and Riverside that already exist. More people means more traffic. I would ask that there be extensive traffic studies done to curtail future problems at this intersection before any additional building moves forward. We appreciate the care you put into the planning of these developments and that residents' input is very important to you. Thank you for your consideration. The next is from Gail Griffin at 6465 Martin Place, Dublin, Ohio, 43017. Thank you for the opportunity to express my thoughts about the development in my neighborhood. Since May of 1985, I have lived at 6465 Martin Place, not far from the roundabout at 161 and Riverside Drive. My primary concerns are the speed and amount of traffic on Martin Road, the traffic congestion around the 161 Riverside Roundabout, and the proposed extra tall buildings. I understand that this is currently a six, there's currently a six story limit, but I hear talk about possible variances. I believe there were good reasons that the six story limit was put in place, and I believe that those reasons are still valid. I would like the city of Dublin to adhere to the six story limit as a firm maximum. I have navigated the roundabout at 161 and Riverside on foot a few times. I felt the need to wait until there was no traffic in any direction before it was safe to cross. We can't count on having pedestrians wait for a lack of traffic to cross at the roundabout. That hardly ever happens anymore. I hope there will be measures put in place to make pedestrian crossing at the roundabout safe. The next one is from Barbara Hart at 4409 Zachary Court, Dublin, Ohio, 43017. I'd like to ask the commission to consider this project with discretion. I'm not a city planner, engineer, or developer. I'm a resident that's being strongly impacted by the traffic that's being created on Martin Road from the existing roundabout and the Bridge Street development. I doubt when Bridge Street was first discussed in the early 2000s, much thought was given to vehicles driving to Bridge Park. Everyone's concern was accommodating arriving cars with garages, on-street parking, and ultimately the overall success of the development. We live with the reality. Since the installation of the roundabout and Bridge Park, there's an unending stream of cars northbound Riverside Drive and Martin Road during peak commute and at times weekend hours. 
Martin Road is now a primary shortcut used to avoid the roundabout traffic jam. Our quiet, unassuming neighborhood is not the same as it was when we moved in. Traffic never stops, and what used to be an out-of-the-way neighborhood and roadway that was mostly used by residents and guests, like most residential development in Dublin, is now a busy thoroughfare. I realize development is inevitable, but why are these ultra-high density developments consistently airmarked for these small corners of southeast Dublin with such limited roadway access? Try not to only think about the positive economic development that you predict will benefit the city and residents, but give thought to how this ongoing development is changing the basic fabric of our Dublin neighborhood that has been my home for more than two decades. Your decisions will make a difference. I appreciate this opportunity to express my opinion. Thank you. And then just a minor interruption. We did have a, a series of comments from Nextdoor that were included in our packet. They're, they're not attributed to individual people, but we did read through those and take those into consideration also. So if you could continue with Nopenberger comments. Yes. This is from Grant Nopenberger at 3173 Martin Road, Dublin, Ohio, 43017. I wanted to express my concern for the overdevelopment of this project. The building codes and laws clearly state a six-story maximum building height, and this project clearly exceeds that limit. This is going to have a ne negative impact on the residents in the direct area and neighborhood of the development. The traffic going down Martin Road has increased so much, and there is a blatant disregard for speed limits the speed limit of 25 miles or the speed bumps. The roundabout is unsafe enough to walk through even with crosswalks. This extra project will only increase traffic down on Martin Road from people using Riverside Drive to avoid the roundabout. With the proposed apartments, there is sure to be an increase in crime. Crime often accompanies increased density, especially with so many apartments, which tend to attract a more transient population than people who are more invested in the community. Currently, there is no green space at Bridge Park or a nearby park that our community can enjoy. A park or green space would be a huge addition to Bridge Park and our Dublin community as a whole that everyone can, <clears throat> excuse me, can enjoy. <clears throat> excuse me, this last one is from Cindy Solar at 3200 Lillimar Court, Dublin, Ohio, 43017. I feel that the proposed addition to Bridge Park is too dense for the roads that already exist at Riverside Drive and the roundabout at 161. Has a traffic study been done for this intersection? The northbound Riverside traffic backs up, backs way south while wa waiting to proceed through the roundabout. This situation also causes problems for residents on and around Martin Road. Cut through traffic and Martin Road residents and neighbors unable to exit Martin Road either north or south to Riverside Drive during busy traffic times. It would be nice if Martin Road at Riverside Drive heading westbound could have a left turn lane installed. One left turn car waiting to turn left onto Riverside Drive southbound backs traffic, excuse me, backs traffic way back up Martin Road. Yes, we could drive around to Route 161 to get to Dublin proper, but is that really a solution? I am not sure larger speed bumps on Martin Road is a solution either. It would be just a band-aid for a problem that would just punish the Martin Road residents with having to bounce over taller bumps every time we leave our neighborhood. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Roush. And thank you for your patience as we read those into the record to ensure that the commission is thinking of these items as we're going into deliberation. With that, I'd like to invite anyone who's in the public today who would like to speak to this application to come forward. Please state your name and address for the record and ensure the green light is on on the microphone. It appears to already be on. Good evening. My name is Scott Herring. I live at 3280 Lillimar Court. And tonight I am here to represent the EDCA and that's the East Dublin Civic Association it's a group of folks who live in Dublin, east of the river, and uh, there's a score of them here tonight, and it sounds like uh, you got a dozen comments online as well. Uh, so certainly there's many more folks who are interested in all this. I've been involved in this group for 20 years. The group's been active in the process of governing our city. And I just wanna take a moment to take a high level here and, and back up, because there's a lot of comments already been made about the very specifics of this project, but I'd like to build on those comments 
and set the tone. So our group's been very involved and the processes are the community plan and how that leads into the, um, the council ultimately drafting and ratifying these codes. And this is our protection, the building standards. So this board, planning and zoning as an advisory, I, I view this more as a, a judiciary that your judges to look at a case and say, yes or no, this meets. I'd like to ask if the second to last slide, there was a slide that said conditions met or not, and that flashed by in less than a second, because um, I think I can be a very good guide sometimes when it says, what are the criteria that are met? Resoundingly, the common theme of all this has been the heights, and simply the code, that the code has said no more than six stories. Only a year ago, I was in these chambers for a city council meeting and a parcel to the south and some of the neighbors who are very close to that, even more close than my house is, uh, made reference to that. And that parcel was rezoned. They called it the Bridge Street, Scioto River neighborhood. And it said, we're changing the code from a, a prior designation to a new one. And in the simple layman terms, it says this will allow up to six stories maximum. So six stories max. It's pretty straightforward. So I don't understand uh, the remarks tonight about, well, maybe we get a waiver. I mean, I'm pleased to see that the open space requirements were met. Why can't we meet the, the maximum heights? So I'll just leave it at that. It sounds like there's other uh, folks who'd like to speak to some more specifics here. Uh, but I did come up with one analogy. So the request is maybe nine stories would be requested here. I'm just thinking uh, PNC over the years has heard a lot of cases and there's been talk about open space and visual corridors and fences and if the code allowed for my neighbor to put up a six foot fence and then they said, Hey, you know what, Scott, I really want to put up a nine foot fence. I'd say, no, that's out of bounds. Six is plenty. And so it is here. Six stories is the code that's maximum. The only way out of this I see is that an appeal would be made to city council, ask for another zoning de designation. And perhaps that could be called bridge street, Toyota River Tower and ask if there's a special place in Dublin where more than six stories could go. But this is 10 years into making six, 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 six. So when I hear nine, I bristle. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Naren. And I do want to mention Ms. Cardellano is here this evening, but also submitted comments uh, along with uh, a wealth of due diligence on images, videos, photos, um, indicating traffic in the area and indicating Mr. Fishman's comments about the onloading the, the deliveries in the area. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to come up and speak? Please state your name and address for the record, and the microphone is currently on. My name is Jerry Bailing. I live at 3289 Martin Road. Uh, I've been there since 1970. I think that's 53 years. I like Dublin. Uh, I have a daughter and a son that went to uh, K through high school in Dublin. Uh, things I like about Dublin are the schools, uh, the parks, the bike paths, libraries, pedestrian friendly areas, library, rec center. That's just a few things. I really love Dublin. But I don't like traffic. Uh, I sit in a back bedroom at a desk I have, and especially this last fall and summer, I hear loud cars and motorcycles. Sometimes I feel like a racetrack is next to me, and I'm not exaggerating at all. I have a friend that lives in Riverside Green, and I asked her if she hears the same thing, and she said she did. 
she has some affiliation with the police department. And I asked her, you know, when I was in high school, we had loud cars and the police would pull us over and cite us for that. I said, isn't that still against the law? She said, yeah, but the police are so overwhelmed with so many things. They don't, they don't have the time to do these trivial stops for loud cars. Anyway, um, um, my, my house is buffered with large trees, so uh, it seems surprising that that sound carries like that. I, this is, uh, uh, speaking is not in my comfort zone. I actually dread this, so I wrote uh, my strong feelings about uh, what I don't like. I would just read that to you. I'm opposed to further development in the area of the roundabout at Route 161 and Riverside Drive. My perspective in, is this area has already created aggravating traffic. We do not need more. It's saturated. At a meeting of the East Dublin Civic Association, residents in the proximity of Martin Road off Riverside Drive posed several questions regarding traffic concerns in that neighborhood. Dublin's Director of Transportation gave lengthy responses to these questions, basically refuting the claims, listing why improvements can't be made, and writing Martin Road off as a collector road. The biggest insult of the response, and a quote that is the crux of the attitude and philosophy I hate was, Traffic is a good problem to have. Maybe that's true if your residence is not affected by these commercial developments and associated traffic. But real estate service says, come into Dublin, it has traffic problems. As a resident of Dublin for 53 years, I like parks, trees, unpolluted air, clean river. I want a local government that wants them also, not more cars that come with many problems pollution, accidents, rage, and threat to pedestrians. For the developers that own property they want to build on, I have no alternatives for you because the mindset that goes with them is let's build something and make a lot of money. They don't care that time after time these developments evolve into decay, a blight on the land, and ruin of natural beauty. It's been around, I've been around 78 years and I've seen it happen all over Columbus and its surrounding suburbs. Travel Morris Road, Route 161, High Street. Think of all the shopping areas that have been developed, decayed, abandoned, leaving eyesore scars in their wake. Should I turn this off? You may leave it on. Thank you, Mr. Bailing. Hello, my name is Joanne Blum. I live at 180 Indian Run Drive in Dublin. I had sent in a, a brief comment too. I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to be here. Um, I've lived in Dublin. I've been a resident uh, more than 23 years. And most of that time, it's been a, a beautiful and peaceful, uh, lovely place to live, felt safe. Um, it's changing rapidly now with uh, a tremendous uh, development going on. Uh, over the last few years, it's, um, it's really been um, uh, uh, coming on like a, a house on fire, really, really increasing. Half a dozen uh, big projects now, like the Indus Project, are in the planning stages. Uh, and each one, uh, in my opinion, as a resident, uh, causes a degradation of the quality of our life in Dublin. More population, more noise, more traffic. Uh, I hear 270 24-7 now from my home. That didn't used to be the case. That's from tree loss and uh, road expansion work a few years ago. Um, I don't think we need more development. And so I've been thinking uh, really strongly about why it's, uh, why it's coming on so much, why it's being approved so readily. I understand why developers want to come in. There's a lot of money to be made. Um, but how much is going to be too much for Dublin? At what point are we going to say it's too much? Um, I think there's a really dangerous idea right now that I hear a lot, that the development is inevitable. You can't do anything about it. 
I hear that from residents a lot. I think a lot of residents feel that way and don't speak up for that reason. I heard it from a lawyer at a, um, a neighborhood meeting that another developer held for us for a, a proposed uh, development over on Cardinal Health property. Uh, and the lawyer said, it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. In other words, there's nothing you can do about it. I think that's a very dangerous idea and not one to be believed. There is a lot we can do about it. Uh, development is not inevitable. And there are communities across the country that are saying no. And they're, uh, they're embracing some new building standards. I'm thinking of beautiful places who want to preserve their beauty like Sedona. They have very strict building requirements there. They didn't want that beautiful red rock mountainside you know, area to be destroyed by excessive development. They want to preserve the beauty uh, and comfort of their, of their community. I think we could do that here too. And I think it's going to become important uh, to draw limits. I think there's a, a, a dangerous idea about how the community should always take a back seat to the economy. That the economy must lead. We have to be about making money. That growth is about making money. Uh, and then the community just sort of has to adjust to the economic decisions being made. And I think that's going on in Dublin right now. Economic decisions being made, corporate offers being accepted, development projects undertaken over our heads, uh, which we then have to kind of accept and adjust to. Um, I think. Uh, kind of community I want to live in is the one where uh, community is first, the way we want to live, the kind of safe community we want to live in, the friendly community, the walkable community we've been talking about, an actual neighborhood, uh, safe and peaceful. Um, and if we want that, then the, the economic choices are made in support of that. We shouldn't have to follow suit uh, behind the money making. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about uh, if the community isn't growing, it's dying. Uh, and I, and I, that's an idea I also think is sick uh, and dangerous because it seems to jobs, retail, businesses, things, new construction going up uh, and running roughshod over our need for a green and healthy and clean environment. Um, in fact, there's all kinds of growth. And I'm, I think perhaps the kind of growth we need more than anything right now is growth in our consciousness, our awareness of what makes for a good thriving community. Uh, and to really draw some limits on and some, draw, look carefully at what's not gonna support the kind of community we want. I was encouraged by learning about a, um, at a UN biodiversity conference that a number of uh, countries approved a, an accord uh, for 30% of preservation of, of natural places in our land, in our oceans, in our coastal areas, 30% by 2030. Um, whether we'll get there is maybe the second question, but there's a, a strong emphasis on that's the kind of growth we need. Growth in preserving biodiversity, uh, healthy flora and fauna in our communities. That's the kind of community I want to live in. And I would love it if Dublin would embrace a vision like that. 30% by 30. 30% of our beautiful area with a Scioto River winding through um, with Indian with things we don't need more of, like retail and restaurants and hotels and apartments. We've got a lot. I'd like to take back up and take a look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bloom. Hi, I am Katie McQuaid. I live at 3260 Lily Marcourt. Dublin 41, Um, Thank you very much for because this is not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, thank you, Diane, for really bringing all of this to our attention very strongly to our to our neighborhood. Um, she hands us papers: the Indus Bridge project, the Stone Ridge Lane apartments, the Y Block. The Taller Road Multifamily, the Village Parkway, the Dublin Village Apartments, that's all within a very, very small area, including Bridge Street that's already been developed. So um, looking at, I will say, ditto, 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 you know, height, traffic, noise, all of that. So I'm not going to go over that again. But other thing I was looking at with this specific is where they're building there's already existing behind them. Bridge Park 
south developed all the way back. There is already right behind the, the Grand. It is a um, community of for older people to live. It's a luxury community. And what we're doing, when you guys looked at, I'm saying you guys, everybody who's been developing Bridge Park, one of the biggest things that I thought it was, we want to really take advantage of our natural beauty of Scioto River. We moved Riverside Drive over so we could have all of this grass area and develop park and have it more, um, a lot more accessibility to the river for us, for our community. But you're building the tallest buildings right up front. So anyone behind them does not get to see the beauty of Scioto River. Why are you putting 11 stories in front of the Grand? Why not put four and then maybe five behind it and maybe seven behind that? Or I'm sorry, six. Sorry, Scott. Six. <laughs> um, why would you put the tallest and then anyone behind them does not get to enjoy the beauty? The beauty of the sunsets over Scioto River, it's gorgeous. I don't know if you've sat at the Bridge Park and seen the sunsets. Well, the people at the Grand have seen the sunsets for years, and you're right about, you're about to take that away from them. So let's consider the community that already exists in that area, and if that we should be taking that away from them. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Madam Chair and Commission, and I did want to take a second and thank you all for your service to our city. I know it's very time consuming. I'm really learning that. <laughs> so um, anyway, before I start, can I ask three quick questions? Because it kind of goes to some of the things that I'm going to talk about. I just want to be accurate in what I'm saying. How many of you live in or near Bridge Park? So, okay. All right. So, um, and then um, how many of you been through the Martin Road neighborhood, Lily Mar, like either walked the shared use path or driven, <laughs> cut through on, on Martin? Okay, okay. Um, and walked through the roundabout crosswalk. Okay, and you're here to live. You, you live to tell, right? Okay, all right, thank you. That's very helpful. So uh, my name is Diane Cardellano. Uh, my husband and I live at 3390 Martin Road. And forgive me too, if some of this is repetitive, I've spoken several times and I forget who... I said what to so um, so we we love living in Dublin we've been here for 25 years and that's why I'm speaking up and we do understand that things change and we are not against development per se okay we're just against what's going on right now um, again ditto and um, to to many of the things that have been said it's just it's too much too soon it's making us very uneasy so I hope you're hearing us um, and that you know, your, your vote will, will be consistent with, with what we're trying to tell you. Um, and the truth is I wake up a lot of mornings with a pit in my stomach when I am contemplating, you know, what is going to become of our home and our property. It's already deteriorated to the point where I, I, it's not enjoyable to sit on my front porch anymore um, like I used to because of all the cut through traffic. I was encouraged by um, city manager's comments in her recent letter that said how important public involvement is and that it's a cornerstone. And, you know, we hear you saying that. And I, I, you know, believe you're sincere in saying that, you know, we just hope that it, it translates into um, actions that are consistent with that. So, um, and I want to thank all the neighbors who came and who have been so supportive and, um, you know, and again, there are lots of people who feel the same way, but they either can't come to the meeting or they don't feel like it's effective to come to the meeting. So um, I've talked to lots and lots of people uh, the last couple of months. Um, so regarding the Indus project, um, the, the density is really over the top. And I won't repeat, you know, the fact that the code far exceeds, or I'm sorry, the proposed heights far exceed what the code allows. And, you know, I heard the mention of the pro forma, um, but, you know, that's, not necessarily that can't trump what, what the law is. So again, we are imploring you to ask them to stick to the code of six stories. Um, let's see. 
And again, I'm, I too am opposed to a variance for the, for the same reasons. It's going to set a precedent. So, um, and, and we know that code is important. We spent two hours a couple of weeks ago reviewing the neighborhood design guidelines for residents. So again, we're just asking that you apply the same standards to code adherence for commercial uh, projects. And you know, at the, the proposed 147 hotel rooms, 169 apartments, and 800 car parking garage, plus an office space, it's an awful lot of cars and people to absorb you know, into, um, uh, you know, it's gonna be use of roads, city services, and schools. Um, again, in addition to all of the other projects being considered. Um, and one of the things that I did, I printed, I had um, submitted a copy of the five uh, vision principles that were outlined in the 2010 vision report. Um, and a lot of the things that are going on seem very contradictory to those stated vision principles. For example, uh, vision principles one, two, and five state the goal of making the district walkable and pedestrian friendly. But all of this added traffic from all the development will do the exact opposite, especially at the roundabout crossing where um, it looks like most of you have, have um, taken that. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of the monikers. Uh, it's called the walk of death, the circle of death, and the human frogger. <laughs> so it is hardly thought of as a walkable and pedestrian friendly area. And this, you know, the added development and the traffic and population that comes with it is not going to help. And, you know, and certainly we don't want a tragedy like the one on Avery Road last week um, to serve, you know, as a wake up call to, you know, making pedestrian safety even, even more um, difficult. Um, so please, you know, consider these things before you say yes to any new projects. Um, and uh, thank you for taking a look at the pictures. <laughs> Some of those days were really cold. <laughs> I don't know if my dog appeared in a cameo in any of those, but um, yeah, it's black and white. But I walk that, you know, a couple times a day. So, um, so anyway, regarding green space, um, it's unfortunate that what has long been the hallmark of Dublin and is even enshrined in its, meta, its motto, it's greener in Dublin, now seems to be getting less and less respect other than in print. And its only value, as some have alluded to, seems to be in its potential to generate money. Uh, one person I spoke to commented that the word green in the motto must now refer to money. I'm wholeheartedly in favor of people and businesses making money. <laughs> That's, I don't have a problem with that. Um, however, when money is the sole motivation, it can cloud one's ability to see clearly what the long-term consequences might be of what they're doing. Um, other residents have observed that Dublin is quickly losing its charm and character, uh, which is contradictory to vision principle number three, which states the goal of embracing Dublin's natural setting and celebrating a commitment to environmental sustainability and Dublin's commitment to environmental preservation. Forgive my bluntness, but I don't think, wow, it's green here, is the first thought that comes to mind when people arrive at the roundabout and drive through Ridge Park. Um, it would be great to have an actual park in Bridge Park. Um, you know, and somebody commented too, we don't need more condos, apartments, hotels, restaurants, and offices. Um, another comment was Dublin starting to look more like the concrete jungle of Manhattan than the Dublin we all know and love. We acknowledge the right for developers to develop their property. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is you know, they don't have the right to, to negatively impact other people's properties in the process. And I know it's a fine balance for all of you to do that. So please understand that we you know, we know that. But um, it does seem that developers often get the deference you know, when it comes down to deciding between whose interests um, take priority. And while it's true that Bridge Park has increased property values up to now, there is a point at which proximity becomes a detriment to property values. And especially in our neighborhood, and especially we're, we're on the gravel road right next to the law firm. It's where our house is. Um, so the encroachment's just really getting close. And you know, I don't know if we've already reached that threshold where you know, our property value is going to be negatively impacted. Um, and maybe I'm in the minority. But personally, money doesn't drive my every decision. It drives some of them, but not everything. I would exchange the increase in our property value for the restoration of the peaceful conditions we once had in a heartbeat. So if you haven't yet visited our neighborhood, I know any of us will be happy to show you around, take a walk with you, and uh, you know, um, 
you know, to show you why we love living there. And so you have a perspective too. You don't live, you know, in our neighborhood, but you're making decisions that will affect it. So I think it's imperative that you spend time there so that you understand. And maybe, um, I think I said this before, but, you know, I hope, we all hope that you view your decisions as though you or a family member lived in the area that's going to be impacted by your decisions. Um, so somebody spoke to crime. You know, we're hearing about things we never have before. There have been two active shooter incidences at Meyer, two suicides in Bridge Park. A friend's daughter um, had a wedding at the AC, had a theft in one room, and a guest had his car stolen. Uh, my hairdresser had a narrow escape from an assault in an elevator at 3.30 in the afternoon. So I'm also wondering how the increase in population will place, if you've thought about how the increase in population will place additional demands on Dublin city resources, such as our amazing police and fire departments and the schools. There's already a waiting list at Hopewell. What's going to happen when dozens or hundreds of new kids come into the community? Um, we've, we've already spoken to the fact that Martin Road, the Martin Road corridor has had a disproportionate impact from the Bridge Park development. So. Uh, you know, with the cut through traffic and the speeding and, you know, we're talking about those things with transportation. So, um, and what bothers my husband and me the most is that we've actually talked about the possibility of having to move if this development pace and volume increases. And that's, you know, we just shouldn't be put in that position. I mean, it, it, it makes me very upset. <laughs> um, and it's also contrary to vision principle number four which is to complement and strengthen Dublin's existing community fabric and also contradicts the city's declaration that Dublin is known as a city that puts residents first. Again, I don't, I don't doubt your sincerity, but it doesn't, you know, we just need to see it translate into um, decisions related to, you know, kind of this runaway development. Um, we appreciate the amenities of Bridge Park, but again, there just seems to be no end in sight with uh, the, the density that's being proposed. Um, you know, the commission and the code are the only firewalls we have and our voices. You're, you're it <laughs> um, for, you know, protecting and preserving our neighborhoods and our homes, our lifestyles, you know, against the ill effects of overdevelopment. Um, so as far as tonight goes, um, I think you vote. I don't know if you, I'm, yeah, but if you do vote, <laughs> a vote for no, a vote of no for the project as currently proposed, you know, I think we can bring it under control, um, would be a, a vote, a yes vote for the residents. And we would very, very much like to see that. Um, so one last thought. The city said they're set to refresh the community plan, which is great news. Considerable projects deserve considerable analysis and evaluation, and it should be given fuller due diligence as the impacts cannot be undone. Please consider the wisdom of slowing down the pace of, and volume of development. Doing so could provide some margin to give this important undertaking the time and attention it merits. With everything in life, whether it's money, power, fame, success, whatever it may be, there must come a point, and somebody else mentioned this one, enough is enough. And you know, so I guess that's the question. When, when is enough enough? Um, we love the city, but we're concerned about its current direction. So our hope is that you are too, and uh, you will make decisions accordingly. So thank you so much. Thank Sorry. you, Ms. Cardellano. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to the commission this evening? All right, Mr. Henschel, could I have you bring back up the concept plan, essentially the three slash four step process? All right, so I did want to clarify for those in the audience uh, that the step that we're on and what is under consideration for this evening. So we did go through an informal review and you heard from the developer and from staff that the commission and staff had significant concern on a couple of the elements that you expressed concern with this evening also. And that is the massing, the scale, the height of the buildings that are proposed in this particular area. So 
at the concept plan review, I like to refer to this in you know simple terms because they're easier for my brain. At this point in the at this point in the process, we are looking at something crayon on paper. So we're really just looking at the 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 format, and you'll hear some discussion tonight about well, you've heard some discussion tonight about the massing, the scale, and that sort of thing, and that does come into consideration when we're talking crayons on paper. The next step, the preliminary development plan, I like to refer to as the Duplo blocks for anyone who looks at those larger format. We're looking at kind of the form, the, the building massing, that sort of scale when it comes to the layout of the block itself. And then when we get into the final development plan, we're at the Legos. We're looking at landscape plans. We're looking at um, accessory structures, all of those types of things. And so we're refining the process. That does not mean that we don't want to look at, you, you heard Ms. Harder talk about even patios. It doesn't mean that we don't want to consider the minor items at this stage in the process. It's just not where the concentration nor the focus is. So with that, I'm going to turn time over to the commission for deliberation. Uh, we will go in turn, and then at the end, we will sum up. So Mr. Chinock, if I could have you start us off. <laughs> you knew it was coming. Great. <laughs> Mr. Chinock, if you could start us off. Um, thank and you. Actually, if I could set the stage for a moment. Um, the Could you bring up the um, consideration criteria? So I've kind of lumped these together, and I want to go through in turn based on these groupings. So the first one that we're going to cover is really that lots, blocks, street types, and land use. So we're going to focus on that. We'll go in turn, and then we'll kind of dive down into the, the individual consideration criteria. So again, lots, blocks, street types, and land use. All right. <laughs> I, I want to first thank, thank the, uh, I think we'll all share this, where we thank the public and uh, the, the notion that um, we, we listen and we take that, your opinions very seriously. We dedicate, I mean, a good portion of this conversation was listening to public comment. And um, I assure you that we take that very seriously and we take that into much, much consideration. So we appreciate you taking the time, everybody that submitted online, everybody that's here today. Um, and you obviously live in the neighborhood, so you're a lot closer to it than a lot of us. We really appreciate that. Um, I think the sentiment is we can do better. Um, I, I look, we, we talked a lot about the scale. We've talked a lot about the massing. Um, we talked about the, the streets, um, this development, uh, while you've made some great progress, I think it's 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 starting to feel a little bit better. Um, I, I think we have a long way to go, to be honest. I think we've talked about you know being smarter, whether whether it's shared parking with some other adjacent garages, whether it's learning from what we've done in other areas of Bridge Bridge Park. Uh, there, there's a lot to learn, um, and 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 what what went well, what we can work on. You know, everything from traffic studies to Again, the scale, the massing, pedestrian-friendly access. I feel very strongly about, I mentioned it many times, about Longshore Street and how we can make that something different, uh, something special if we do do that connection. But I, I just think, um, you know, to summarize, uh, you know, kind of what we're talking about, I, I think we can just, we can do better here. I, I think, again, putting the, I like the point of putting the community first. Um, and I think we just all need to kind of look at this as an, as an opportunity to, uh, do something really great here and 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 do better with what what we do better than what's what we're seeing uh, here today again around the the massing the scaling the heights um, there's a reason that's all that 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 is on place um, and I think we need to make you know those considerations. Thank you, Mr. Chinock. Um, Ms. Harder, and again we're focusing. If you look at the screen on three and four at this time. Okay. Um, again. Um, I um, am very happy to see so many residents come out. Um, I have been a part of uh, this association as well. I live down the road. Um, I, um, but, um, and I'm glad to see everybody out and your voice does matter. And, and uh, being as articulate as you are about the issues, I think it's very helpful. Um, it's, I'm a rule follower. So when I hear six stories, I like to think that people before me um, spent a lot of time coming up with those reasons and um, that needs to be something that we um, take great consideration into it. Um, I, I am a, a type of person that looks at 
at the spacing of things, just how I move around within a, a space. So I think about driving down Riverside and um, how close you're kind of coming around a curve a bit and how close you are um, to the new building site. And is it distracting? Is it, um, you know, you're going to have people making turns on Detella. You're going to have um, people stopping at the light coming up. So all of those things, uh, it's, it's also that gateway, that leaving, that coming in um, and having that feeling. Um, and I think about the traffic uh, where cars are parked and coming in and out. And uh, I know we've come accustomed to slowing down in that area, but it's unpredictable how the space is moving. Um, what I do like is that um, they are taking a lot of thought into the the plans of um, thinking about how to connect um, and uh, and that open space. And the open space is very important. Uh, and I don't want to see that be diminished if you need to bring down the site. I love the idea of connecting with, um, concerning the garage, connecting with other garages. And maybe that can be done through the hotel as well, too, if it's um, uh, parking and so forth of that. But um, um, I think those are things that are very important. I liked reading about the, that, um, you know, uh, first of all, you're uh, thinking about the art um, and uh, connecting with the with with uh, the Dublin Art Association as well as um, Dublin schools, I would suggest, too. So all that kind of comes together. Um, and, um, and with the adoption of, of the plans and how the uses are and how someone as a pedestrian is walking in the space. And I spent time thinking about that because I want to feel like I can walk very easily um, to and from places, see people enjoying the spots, um, and then also understanding uh, what the makeup of the building is and uh, the connections. And I'm sure we're going to get into that with the road connections and then how people are moving to and from um, the building itself, because that is something that needs to be worked on as well, too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harder. Mr. Way, and again, three and four lots, lots, st blocks, street types, and I hear, land use. I, I hear you. Um, again, I want to thank the community for coming out. It's great. This is what the public process is supposed to be about. So we appreciate all of the feedback that you've provided tonight. Um, I also want to thank the applicant. I think you listened to us at the last meeting and came back with some nice changes to the to the layout, the moving the residential away from 270. I think the park in the center, how you resolve the grades there works out very well. So I see things moving in the right direction. Um, I am still challenged by the height. Again, we've heard a lot about height to, uh, tonight. I haven't heard a compelling reason why we need more height. And, um, and you have lowered the height from the last meeting. Um, and now we understand that it's now in a connector building um, which I'm very challenged by because you're taking two 220 foot long buildings and sticking a 60 foot building connecting them, which gives you a 500 foot long building. And I know there's this idea of the pass through, uh, that you, that we talked about in the last meeting, but you know, that was a pass through of a one building, not two buildings connected. So I just think that massing is now gotten out of scale and I I'm challenged by that. And then, um, you know, I realize the site is very narrow and that's, you guys are struggling to kind of figure out how to make things work. And I think the buildings along Riverside Drive, I think in terms of their massing, not necessarily height, but just you're fitting those into that, that zone, I think pretty well, except for the connector. But, the, but going to the east of uh, Longshore Drive, there's a lot of space there. And I know you've got challenges with the grade. I think the hotel's occupying a really big footprint that it could be more compact. And, the, and I'm still struggling with a garage that looks like a garage. And I know you had some beautiful images in, in the package that we received of how you would put, you know, some kind of a facade on the garage, I assume all the way around and screen it as a garage. But in terms of the density of the site and the height of buildings, I, I don't think you're using the garage in a way that you could. Um, you could easily integrate some uh, residential that would um, line the garage on the north and south side and still have your 180 foot wide garage um, and keep a 270 foot you know, dimension between which allows you to have the ramping that you need. So I think there's a lot of things that still need to be addressed. I think you've done, you've made some good moves, but from a, 
lots, blocks, and land use, I think um, the massing, the height, still needs a lot of work. Thank you, Mr. May. Mr. Supalak. Again, I'm going to go down a similar path to my fellow commissioners. Um, everybody who spoke, and forgive me, I'm going to do first names, uh, Katie, Jerry, Scott, Diane, Joanne, Tammy and Brian, Robin, Gail, Barbara, Grant, and Cindy. Thank you. It's always delightful to hear from you. David, Miguel, and John, always a pleasure um, to hear from you. Thank you for, thank you to everybody who's, who spoke. Um, there is good here, right? There is um, rich consideration of open space. Uh, you guys have made a lot of um, adjustments since last time we spoke. The the park in the in the middle is really starting to become compelling. I really applaud even the consideration of putting retail or commercial space adjacent that so that it does liven up the space and it isn't just a pass through, but has some, some energy that's a little bit different. I applaud the commercial, uh, the office building to the corner. Um, the, you know, the commentary on the floor plates driving the facade and the massing, uh, the office doesn't suffer from that. It allows you more flexibility to do, to architecturally address that corner the way it wants to be wants to be addressed, so that, that is a strong move. Generally, I'll, I'll say variation from building to building. You guys are working on five buildings. This is a large swath. I don't know that we, even in the other portions of Bridge Park, we've done five buildings at a time, right? Um, that has the potential to all of a sudden make all five look, look very similar. I, I think you're trending away from that, and I would continue to advocate for that, so it seems like it's... Uh, Fabric, not you know, not a singular development. Um, uh, applaud even the commentary about, and I was kind of poking around it, concerned about some of the things we were hearing. I applaud working with a consultant or relative to the commercial space and ensuring uh, what what really needs to be here. Concerns, much like uh, many in the public, much like my fellow commissioners, concerns about it being overbuilt generally. The height in particular is um, uh, problematic. It, it happens also to drive a number of other things, the scale of the parking garage uh, as, a, as a sort of secondary problem as a, as a result of the height and scale. I concur with Mr. Way. I'm very concerned about the uh, connector piece and the mass block, the super block it starts to, it starts to create. The concept of the image shown and the, the pass-through is compelling. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that the scale of it is working at present. Um, I'm concerned generally at this point, and it's un, it's, some of these comments are a little unfair to say uh, at this stage, but nonetheless I'll say I'm concer concerned about access, I'll say, in, in a few different ways, one of which is still the parking garage and the access Right. If we if we hide if we hide and can't find parking spaces, they might as well not be there. Right. It's um, um, a worrisome situation that can can be solved with more vehicular access and more points. I actually think the garages through the rest of the district have done a good job in that regard. They're easy to find. Right. They're not they're not um, a long like walk away. I understand there's uncomfortable gymnastics here relative to the stone that is below, I, I would advocate for if we, if, it, if the access and the proximity and the, the, my intuitive knowledge of it being there um, is not easily solved via vehicular access, at least help it solve via, via uh, pedestrian access. I easily think even, even in the current floor plan, even if you didn't massage anything else, you could, you could add two more um, pedestrian access points up from the long long street side, one of which you know down closer to taller, one of which could be down into the park, and that would give everybody intuitively more mental access to it. They would understand that they would find the parking spaces because they would find them um, see the the walkway access, things like that. Right, access across the board. You have quite a few platform sort of elevated platform buildings, you're, you're already showing them activated in a meaningful way. Um, some of them might be very private relative to the residential you're, you're developing. Some of them could very well be more of the public 
the public realm. Uh, speaking to the ones around the, the hotel in, in particular, right? Those, I'm just going down the street to AC Milan. We've all, everybody in Dublin has been to the AC Milan, whether or not we've stayed a night there. We've, we've um, accessed the restaurants that are there. We've uh, uh, perhaps interacted and had a drink, drink at the bar in the, in the lobby. Those are the type of things that I think that consideration to activating it. So it's not just for the specific hotel users, but for the public realm, I think will be important. And so if there's platforms there, access and how you ne negotiate those things will become um, critical. Forgive me, I get a little bit more. Let me make sure I got to it. Architecture, uh, th and this is, forgive me, I, Miguel, I think this is your world. It's not really fair to say, to say at this point because it is very much um, preliminary, preliminary um, models at best, not very well developed, but I am concerned about a couple things and I wanna just articulate, it, articulate them. Um, Mr. Wade touched on it, the garage, right? There aren't full garages here. They are often very, very skinned, but even that skinning is um, only a portion of the garage. So you have a garage that is a garage on four sides and skinning that on four sides will make it, will not take away the fact that it's a garage um, and it'll be, you know, it's a, it's a mass in there. So one, that's concerning in, in and of itself. Um, I, I do think wrapping it with buildings should continue to be studied in a meaningful way. I do think the scaling down would be, would be uh, a, a critical component of it. I do actually think given even despite the grade on the taller side, stepping the bottom floor in a little bit allows you then to walk down and have access on that side. Again, the access commentary. Um, the, other, the other commentary is there is a lot here and it's not always bad, but I think when it, when it, it is uh, the lion's share of this development, there is a lot that is driven inside out, floor plate driving the exterior Right, that commentary on the residential, that commentary on the hotel, you have three out of the five buildings are driven that way. Um, I, I think that's a little bit over overdone with that, uh, with that relationship and maybe it has to be rethought or ultimately architected carefully at a later date. Um, there's, again, there's a lot good here going there's a lot of concerns. I, I would just continue to articulate, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chinock said it, we can do better. I would continue to articulate, don't just see this as the buildings, see this as how the public realm interacts in and, in and through it. You've done a good job starting to, starting to scratch that itch quite a bit with some of the spaces. Continue down that path relative to everything else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supalak. Mr. Fishman. Well, my colleagues have said it all. I don't disagree with anything they've said. I do want to repeat and add that I really appreciate the residents coming. Dublin looks like it does because of you people. I've been going to these meetings since 19, I've been on these committees since 1977. So I even beat you as far as how long I've been here. Uh, but, but, and, and, and that's why you're, you're why Dublin looks like it does. I've said this before many times. I've, I've gone over this material before I come, which I do every time, and I think I'm going to vote one way, and then the residents come in, and you completely change my mind. So I, I, I really appreciate it, and I hope you keep coming. I also want to say to the developer that I really appreciate the effort that you've, uh, just in the second meeting, and we're I think the residents should understand we're very early in the process. So. Um, I, I, I really appreciate what, what you're doing and the work you're putting in, and I, I know it's an arduous job. Um, um, I will say that I can sum it up in, 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 in two sentences. It's too much development for too small a site. And I think over the years I've been here, it happens over and over and over again uh, when it starts out. We, um, I sat in... I was trying to count how many meetings when we developed this code, at least 20 meetings in the, in the two years we worked on this code. And I remember one consultant after another saying, well, when we say six stories, and I think Scott <laughs> said it best, but we mean six stories, okay? 
and waivers are to be given only in urgent situations where there's a compromise and we get something else or whatever happens. So I think that, that your effort's been great, but I think that the residents said it best that it's too much development for six acres. And, and the thing that worries me is the word that everybody hates to hear is precedent. And, and, and if we allow nine stories now, we're going to get nine stories or maybe 10 in the next development in this, this um, uh, uh, in Bridge Park. And I, you, you can bet your house on it that they'll be asking for it. So I, I think we have to, uh, I think waivers are for an emergency. I hate waivers. And I think that we, we spent two years on the code and, 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 and uh, we made compromises when we did the code. I wasn't happy about six stories when, when, when this was uh, 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 um, presented, um, when we were doing the code. But I, th I think that the residents deserve to know that the code is the code and, and, and we don't add three stories to buildings because we want to jam more building on a site. I think you've done a great job. I love the, the open space. Um, uh, and I think, <laughs> I, I can quote all these residents that were fabulous that, that, that Dublin is green because people come in here and, and want it to be green. And we, we're, we're doing our best to, to make this the best place we can. So uh, not to get into a big thing, but I, I, I think it's just too much development for too small a space. And I think that we, if we, we have to start giving waivers, we might as well not have a code. Okay, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishman. Mr. Schneer. Thank you. Um, again, I'd like to echo my fellow commissioners and, and thank the public for their, uh, for their interest, their uh, sincerity. Um, I know for, for many of you, you indicated this, this isn't an easy thing that you are doing, and so we acknowledge that and appreciate uh, the, your effort in doing so. Um, I, I would like to point out that the applicant or an applicant if the applicant were to follow the code, uh, you know, some of you would like to see no development. You know, we, we're limited in our authority. You, you, you know, the co people have said the code is the code. Well, we could say it another way. The code provides for certain development on this land. So our authority is limited. We can't say, no, you can't build anything here. And so, uh, it, I think I hopefully you all can all appreciate that. It's what, as fellow commissioners have indicated, what is the character of what is allowed uh, for this. Um, turning towards the applicant, I think you've made great strides in this and in, in echoing the fellow commissioners, you'd be congratulated for that. I really welcome the additional uh, commercial development. Um, I think that does provide some great interest in, in this. You know, the, 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 it's not the elephant in the room because the elephant in the room is something you don't talk about. This is the elephant that we do talk about is, is, is the massing, obviously. And wh what's wrong with it? I mean, I, in, in my opinion, one thing is driving the other. That parking garage is, is huge, is massive because it has to be because of the required parking. And staff has indicated well, maybe there's some ways to reduce the size of the parking garage with shared parking, et cetera. Um, I, I go to Bridge Park a lot. Um, the distances from parking garages to places is, is difficult already. Um, to be fair, uh, the parking garages, in my opinion, aren't full. Um, but uh, I don't think the answer is, well, just we'll just start shrinking by having a smaller parking garage, but we'll accommodate the requirements because all those overflow will park in another garage. That just exacerbates the, the situation and makes those tenants, visitors, whomever, that much further from the, the already pretty far distances in here. So if you got to shrink the garage, then you got to shrink the buildings. Um, and the one one tends to feed off the other. I will say um, I like the, the direction it's going. I still 
I think the connector is an interesting idea. It just comes off, as some fellow commissioners have indicated, more like a super, just a super block, one long building. If that was articulated in a way that was really interesting, I mean, in my mind's eye, I know it was the way it was um, drawn doesn't necessarily indicate it. I mean, if it were X stories of, of you know, just pure glass um, provides some real interest, um, but that doesn't, it, then it truly is a connector and just a connector and has no other function. And I understand that's not what you're, you're interested in. Um, I, I want to make my own statement with respect to waivers. Waivers are, are in the code. They're part of this process. I, I said the code is the code, but I also believe that it, under appropriate circumstances, waivers are appropriate. They're allowed. Uh, and I am perfectly, speaking obviously just for myself, perfectly open to granting waivers under appropriate circumstances. I'm not ready to say that I, I favor a waiver for building height on this because there's some other massing issues associated with that. But um, if there's one area in, you know, in Dublin where density, uh, in, which I, in this area, um, I say density and excitement and activation sort of go hand in hand. Um, I think the Marriott AC established, and I won't say precedent, but established a look uh, on, on the south side. So I'm not as bothered as probably at least some, if not all of my fellow commissioners with respect to the building height per se. But when you take that in combination with the mass, with, with the parking garage, et cetera, then it, it, it just becomes too much. And you fight, you fight one by fighting the other. And you know, I think you end up with just reducing density and reducing the mass as, as, as a, a function of that. Um, I think those were, yep, that was it. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Fishman. I agree with you that waivers are sometimes necessary, and I th and the code does allow for waivers. And and I when I say I hate waivers, I hate them to just being the purpose of getting more density. And and, and so I think sometimes they're necessary. And I, I, I if we had to, if you had to have a waiver, I see. But I I think that when you, we have waivers, so we can just get more density. Uh, more building in, in, in a spot, and, and uh, um, that's why I asked you about the green space. I, if you were trading it for an acre of green space, then I would say, well, that's something that's worthwhile. But um, anyway, so I, I agree with my colleague there. Thank you, Mr. Fishman. May I say something? Briefly? Yes, Mr. Box. Just very briefly on the question of, of waiver. Um, you know, they, they are part of the code that a waiver would be required to um, permit greater than six stories for these buildings. There are specific criteria and submittal requirements for the applicant at some point to request a waiver if this application continues to proceed. Um, but the waiver question per se, just more so for the, the benefit of, of everybody in the room um, in the in the public, the waiver question per se is not on the agenda for this evening. So um, I, I encourage our commissioners focus on our criteria for concept plan review. Thank you, Thank Mr. Boggs. Um, I do want to give opportunity. We branched out into all of the criteria, uh, but uh, I want to give opportunity, especially to my right hand side for any items that you did not speak to, but wanted to because of my futile attempt at trying to <laughs> channel us this evening. Mr. Way, Ms. Harder, Mr. Way. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the the whole Longshore Street character quality. Um, you know, this is the northern end to the Bridge Street or Bridge Park, and you know, I think it needs to be something different and something unique that's going to draw people from the south to the north. And so, I guess I would encourage greater emphasis put on the character quality of the street to make it different than the rest of Longshore Street. 
and I was I was um, in our first meeting. You had talked about that, showed us some imagery, and I thought maybe that was the direction that you all were going. But it doesn't appear that you've gone that way. So I would make a comment that more attention to that. And again, I think the the Central Park um, is going to get probably pulled into your thinking about some of the comments that you're hearing tonight about massing and use where use is the parking garage how big the park the hotel block is and maybe you might even rethink where land uses are in general and just how they all work so um I, again i think from an open space standpoint you've got the right moves and the right connections um but i don't see that on longshore street yet think of longshore street as part of the open space network thank you mr way all right, um, Mr. Henschel, if I could have you put up the conditions. Uh, so my, my comments are very similar to my fellow commissioners. I wanna talk numbers here. I'm an engineer and so I, I like numbers. Uh, what we're looking at as far as this concept plan, this application goes, uh, specifically to the corridor buildings in relation to the code, it's an increase or a request for a 19% increase over the allowable building height. So that, that's a statistically very significant increase. When it comes to parking, it's a 15% request over what is permitted by the code sans waiver at a later point in time. However, uh, if we look at what's already in the development, uh, the building heights that were provided to us, if we're looking specifically at the comparable buildings, so the AC being a bookend, not including AC, it is a 30% overall increase for corridor building to corridor building. So that those are the numbers that we're looking at. And so why most of you are out here and also the fellow co commissioners talking about the building height. Waivers are contemplated in the code and the AC more took read, ready um, uh, opportunity to use a waiver to enhance that, but it was a, a legitimate reason. There's a roundabout, it was a bookend, and ultimately we made a recommendation, city council approved, yes, we wanted to incorporate this height. Right now we're looking at an entire block, five buildings that all exceed by 15 to 30% of what is either permitted or is um, incorporated in this area. And I think what you're feeling is we're not comfortable with that. That is too much, that is overbuilt, and that would not be supported by the commission at this time. Uh, I do think on the, the recommendations here with the conditions that that speaks specifically to conditions number two and seven. Uh, oh, they've changed, sorry. I'm looking at the conditions in the packet. So the conditions starting to, uh, the, so it would be number three, the massing of the building, and number seven. Okay, so the, the heights of the building, uh, the way that that condition is currently worded, continue to work with staff to ensure the heights of the building are compatible with the intent of existing buildings. I believe what I heard from the commission was work with staff to ensure that they are compatible with the code and intent of existing buildings of the Scioto River neighborhood. So with the commission's approval, I would like to amend the condition and applicant will give you an opportunity to, to speak to um, the conditions prior to our taking a vote. So with that wording change, and then in number three, again, just changing the wording, to reduce the massing of the buildings to meet the code and complement the existing character of the Scioto River neighborhood. Then, because uh, one of the other concerns was parking, obviously, if there is a reduction in heights of the building, that would re reduce the amount of required parking. And so speaking to number four, um, uh, identify opportunities to reduce the amount of parking to meet the code and the, the associated size of the parking structure. Again, looking to the rest of the commission, making sure I see at least three other head nods, and I see three. Are there any other specific items in relation to the conditions 
that we see this evening that we want to add. I have a couple of other items that I want to speak to, but uh, Mr. Schneer. Not add, but modify. So, um, well, when you're ready to put those up there, I think it's working on them. But um, what was on our pack of two, three, and four, now it would be two, three, I guess still two, three, and four. The, I'm, I'm concerned about tightening the verb, saying explore, it could be satisfied by we did explore and we didn't come up with anything. So, um, if, you know, the first one's prescriptive, you know, the applicant consolidate the numbers. So do we want to say, do we want to just say the applicant provides access or tells us why? I, 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 Am I the only one? It just says. Uh, so, so I would have engineering speak to that one because that's more on the. So this is item two. Well, provide yeah, it, access to the garage from Longshore Street. So if, for instance, engineering said, hey, we don't want that because that introduces some public safety measures. It's too close to an existing intersection, anything like that. We wouldn't want to be prescriptive if it's contrary to engineering requirements. Thank you, Mr. Hendershaw. Yeah, so I guess just thinking through that, I think maybe we can also put some language about to the satisfaction of the city engineer to give us some flexibility, but the general intent is to I'm consolidate access points and align with existing access points on the other I, side of Moon. I like that. I mean, and, and, and that same sentiment in, it, you know, with respect to three and four, like five say work with staff. So incorporating the same kinds so of, in three and four that so three i would suggest um the applicant can uh, the applicant and then strike continue to explore opportunities to the applicant so it now reads the applicant reduce the massing of the buildings to meet code and complement the existing character of the scioto river neighborhood yes can we can we eliminate the along shore drive piece of that can we just say access to the garage because i don't i'm not convinced we want access off along shore uh, i think subject to the city engineer we're fine right now that particular condition we have access to the garage so if the condition were access to the garage striking longshore that's already met And then number seven, uh, because it's not explored the opportunity or anything like that, it is the applicant continue to work with staff to ensure. Yeah, see, that's the language. The height. That, so I, I think we're good yeah. there. Again, adding the meet the code. Now, I do want to offer one call out, and this is speaking one commission member, and I will ask if there is a, a general feel. We want to meet the code. Understanding, you know, waivers do have a process. I think you're hearing our discomfort. We're not comfortable with increasing all five building heights. If you were to come back, again, this is concept plan, so final development plan is where we get some teeth in it. If you were to come back and have a bookend opportunity that is minor height approval, and I know this will make at least one person in the audience uh, uncomfortable, that would be a different consideration than all five buildings of a block to exceed the code by 15 to 30%. So that's one commission member's opinion. Um, with the code, we're never possible. Agreed. But like we did with the hotel, you use the word bookend. I think that if, if it goes up one story uh, as high as the hotel, and the other ones maybe go below the code, um, I think we're fine. I think it's a give and take. I think Correct. that, that, that uh, the residents would be very happy if we, instead of a five-story building in the parking garage, it was underground, you know? And, and so there's all kinds of possibilities, I think. And, and I, think we're, they, I think the developers are on the right track. I just, it's easy to say, it's just, the, the residents said it's, it's too much development for the six-acre site. 
and 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 I think they're entitled to that. So I, I think, and I think your your suggestion is good. Yes. Uh, additionally, that does come with some added benefits with the commercial building a little taller, and I stress a little taller than it does shield additional noise and and that sort of thing from the residential units and especially the internal residential units, understanding that we are taking into consideration adjacent properties that are already existing. <coughs> so that is not lost on the commission. Let the record reflect that the chairperson indicated a foot, a, <laughs> exactly. a little. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Mr. Schneer. I needed a laugh. Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> so, does, so does the number seven really allow the flexibility still for if there's something you know, something unique or something that would cause us to allow. Yes, because the waiver is part of the code. Right. And so meet the code and intent of the existing buildings of Scioto River neighborhood. Right. I think with those two coupled together and this being concept plan rolling into a final uh, a preliminary development plan. So you weren't trying to change the language. That's what I was getting at. You're, you're okay with that. Uh, just the meet the code language. So in number, what is it? We put that back. Uh, three. Oh, we're looking at the. And then number right. seven go dovetails right with number three because they're speaking essentially to the same elements. Right. Mr. Hanschel, did we thoroughly confuse you this evening? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, no, it's. I think I've got everything that Need the has been discussed. So in red, I've struck out the sections that um, are not as direct and then added sections to meet code. Um, if you see any other items here, please let me know and I'd be happy to adjust them. Well, I, I'm not sure that if you read four by itself, reduce the amount of parking spaces. If the massing, you now we're telling them they have to do something right. they may not have to do. Yeah. I think we can revert number four to the original language because it covers the hey, explore opportunities to meet the code. If we reduce the scale of the buildings, then automatically the required and the allowable parking spaces will be diminished. And so therefore. Right, right. I, I think it'd be important when they reduce the size that they meet the code on the parking too, of course. Correct. Yeah. All right, Commission, looking for your view on the conditions before I allow the applicant to come back up. Seeing head and, and if I may jump in here yes, just real please. quickly. Given that this is a concept plan review and both the applicant and the Commission are, are looking at a concept um, to the Chair's point about meeting code, I think that the pur the purpose of a concept plan review is to signal to the developer and to the community at an early stage of the process what the commission's expectations are. And so those are reflected in these conditions. But it should not be taken by the applicant or create an expectation in the commission or public that um, coming back with a preliminary development plan which is a more mature part of this process, uh, that there may still be waivers that the developer chooses to request and that are evaluated under those ap applicable criteria. So just to set that expectation, there may still be waivers requested, but this is a signal to the applicant and the public and the commission of where you are now based on the concept that you've seen. Thank you, Mr. Boggs. And along with that disclaimer comes the invitation that you're welcome to join us. I realize this dedicates a lot of your time as well, but you're welcome to join us at the next phases if this application proceeds, again, to speak to us, even to refer to your earlier comments. So we will certainly listen then as we have listened this evening. So thank you for your participation this evening. So with that, the applicant, I'd like to invite you back up. Um, Understanding where the commission is, uh, if you would, this concept plan, so we're really kind of informal. Normally, I would ask the, the applicant if they wanted to proceed with a vote from the commission. Does that stand for this evening, Mr. Box? Yeah, I, I think it is still fair to, to ask the applicant if they want to proceed with the vote. Um, you know, 
given the conditions that you have put forward or table for another night Thank as you. we typically would. Thank you, Mr. Box. We'll give them a moment to deliberate before we... All right, so we'd like to invite you back up um, and ask if you would like the commission to move forward with a vote this evening, understanding that we have modified the conditions as you see on the screen. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, certainly. Oh. And Mr. Hounshell did all of us a service by delineating the red from the, so the only changes are in red. And I won't read out loud. Yeah, oh, yeah, we're, we're fine. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I will entertain a motion for uh, approval of the concept plan with the nine conditions as modified this evening and displayed on the screen. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Supalak. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Way. Ms. Beal. Mr. Snare. Yes. Mr. Fishman. Yes. Ms. Call. Yes. Mr. Chinock. No. Ms. Harder. Yes. Mr. Supalak. Yes. Mr. Way. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Beal. Thank you, Ms. Beal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, with that, that is our final case for this evening. Again, we thank the, the public for coming out. We, take, we thank the applicant for their time and for the dedication and for the public engagement. We certainly appreciate that that is part of the process. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming you back for a next step in the process. All right, for communications, Ms. Roush, do you have anything for us this evening? I just have some really minor um, date confirmation. So our next meeting is next week. We have back-to-back -back meetings, so just so that's on everybody's radar. Um, packets will be, Zach will be writing furiously and uh, when he gets to work tomorrow uh, for those applications that are on that agenda. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, for, for ease of continuing the meeting, if you would like to continue your... Can everybody Ladies please take their conversations to the hall? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So then um, another sort of save you, the date Ms. item is the state of the community is going to be on March the 9th. Um, I'm sure you'll all be getting formal invites to that, but just so you have that on your radar. Um, and that's at the exchange like it is or has been in the past couple of years. Um, and then I know Chris Will from our office um, mentioned time. about the community plan March and... Time. Um, kicking that off, we were looking at maybe a March time frame from that. That's ultimately shifted to April, just given it all the things that are happening in March. So we'll give you some more specific dates about that, but that's going to have to be a couple weeks out. So right. any questions or anything for me? No. Nope. Denny? March yes, 9th that's okay. Is the state of the city. The, the next meeting, as so my calendar says, Thursday, February 15th. It's next week. It's the 9th. We have a 9th meeting. Oh. And is there also one on the 15th? Yes. No. No. No, 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 no. we moved. No. When we approved the dates, for, so last year when we approved the dates, it originally was on the 15th. There is a conflict, so we moved it up to the 9th, so that might be that why. Was, this is a calendar. This was from the email. This was from Lori's. Okay. Calendar. I'll double check that. It is, it is officially next Thursday. Does that cause we, any we problems got for people? individual invitations for each of the meetings, so they should yes. be in your... Yeah, she Accurately. sent a bunch like emails okay. with all these things, but this one says Thursday, February fifteenth. Was it a cancellation? Which is wrong on two counts. <laughs> yes, it is. It's okay. Wednesday, and but it's <laughs> the wrong date anyhow. Okay. okay. I'm yeah, good. I Thank yeah. You. Sorry, on mine it's correct, but okay. Apologize. Hey. For... Any communications from the commission to staff? We have cataracts. Did I answer your question, Kathy? I just couldn't hear what you said right after, you know, we have the, was there anything additional to that? I'm sorry. No, so we have the meeting next week, right. and then the save the date for a state of the community is March the 9th. Okay, that's and what I have. And then the postponement okay. of Thank the, you. March to April. Yes. Okay. All right. 
Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, meeting adjourned. Thank you for spending another Thursday night. And I have my official gavel because I have yet I wouldn't tell you that. to bang the gavel. I, yes, thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone. I'm going to mention that you have done this.